can start, I would like to welcome all the people today here to this workshop on abstraction design methodology and this the ball thing, as we like to call it. And we are two, four, six, eight, nine, nine, and then ten, ten people from Bolzano, and then we have people from uh, Finland as well, and from Cagliari, and then we have. Uh, uh, I I think you are from Ankara. Uh, Baris, but you are not in, in Ankara f at the moment, but in any case, uh, uh, he is for, uh, we have people from the Technical University of Ankara, and then we have, uh, we have here students from the bachelor level, from the master level, and from the PhD level in computer science, as well as researchers. We have uh, a glo global software studios research group pre present today, in the area from Ibiza, or from uh, other sites remotely connected. And uh, so today, today's workshop is held by Kalle Launiala from uh, Citrus Solutions, and uh, I will just give the, the floor to him now. And first, but, for, but first, I would like to ask everybody to have a big clap for him. And uh, we can start, Kalle. Okay, and uh, if you can manage. Uh, I try to monitor the chat, but uh, I think we can have questions in between. Uh, I've held uh, this, I've presented the ADM a few times before uh, in the Microsoft's Finnish kind of annual event of two sessions. And in those sessions, they were really kind of presenter focused only. So uh, we had full demonstrations, but really no questions in between. And now just very recently, I've, uh, we've had few few um, meetings with Microsoft people who were kind of complete strangers to the ADM and the ball, and we found out that using mainly whiteboard to begin with and focus on uh, quite limited areas of software architectures work as the best demonstration of understanding how ready to use it is and where the biggest powers come already hands-on. And then when we get to that point, then we can start have a hands-on uh, hands-on experience on Visual Studio, however you feel that you want to play it, we can use this workshop as a, or this two hours as a, that I, I play the demonstrations and then I show how you can get your hands on to the very same stuff or however you want to play it. And then based on today's session, uh, I'll craft uh, more material on tomorrow's session for more advantage use of uh, what you can do for uh, in a re reusability aspect so far of what ADM provides and uh, how it actually doesn't much differ from existing options, but it kind of brings brings uh, certain stuff together. So I think we try to play it as dynamic, but let's see how how you want to see the stuff then. Does this sound okay? Uh, sure, sure, it is okay, it is okay for us, and uh, I just ask you to give a very, very, very brief introduction again to ADM and the ball before we, we play with the code, so um, let's assume that not everybody read the, the paper, let's just say that, and in any case, nobody will get mad at you if you repeat things, so if you can give a very, very, very brief overview, overview on what ADM is and then what the ball is for us. Yeah, that's that's exactly why we use the whiteboard. So let's. I try to. I test drive it a bit. I think. Uh, I think it works for this. Let's see. So you should see my whiteboard right now. Yes. Yes, we yeah. see it. Okay. I'll separate this kind of. Uh, if I had more space, I'll, uh, I'll actually draft the comparison of the area so that we actually have a ADM as the core methodology. That's one kind of separate context of, of focus. Then what we have is the ball as kind of... Uh, Core plus abstract model for information. 
And I'll keep these two as a separate and focus mostly on the ADM, because for technical people, it kind of concretes, makes the concrete how we can then have some, something called as the ball. And uh, <coughs> the ball is kind of a combination of, you can think of it as a concrete library kind of thing, but with ADM it's, uh, it's a bit more. But we probably keep the ball for now as a, something that we start to refer when I first explain a bit more what ADM is. I made a good kind of agenda. I'll give you a very brief background of how we ended up to have something like ADM. Let me see if I can paste that one. So, <clears throat> basically, ADM was something that uh, started to, well, they, uh, it started to develop by accident, or, well, it born by accident. Basically, uh, we had a need for, to control the development uh, of uh, certain reference architectural stuff. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, my English is a bit bad on this. We, uh, we had a very strict reference architecture on a uh, Finnish taxation agency project. And we had a, faced a challenge where our resources were constantly changed. So we needed to find a way how we can uh, unify the developer outcome so that when ev whenever there is a person jumping in um, for a few months of work, we kind of know what he did so that next person can take over. Or we can flexible uh, kind of change the uh, <coughs> uh, actual persons in the role to make the tasks. And um, for that, we kind of found out a way to structurize the code in a fashion that we separated in the core model something that we call operations and then the actual information or such as class model. And this we first did as a manual way. So if you think of, uh, do you see these as boxes, by the way, right now? Uh, we see operations, information, and class model, yeah. Yeah, okay, this I don't see, it should be trying to get them as boxes, but uh, let's, okay. So basically, <coughs> I'll try to give you a very brief background, but this kind of uh, builds the core atoms in the ball, coming to those next. Uh, <clears throat> we kind of separated the functionality from the, the traditional object-oriented programming, when, where its uh, reusability is often tried to, tried to uh, or achieved through the using of public methods and that kind of stuff that's supposed to stay the same. But because it often ends up into the clutter that when, if you are not the original author of the code, you don't anymore know by hand where that reusability is, is built on. And because of our uh, environment, we have kind of average or even newcomers as an object-oriented programmers. So we kind of had a relatively uh, average quality code uh, exploding all, all around our object model. And we first came into the model where we separated operations as in a word documents. Because of the taxation project requirements, everything needed to be documented anyway. So we kind of have operations that had uh, parameters, then some parameter validations, execution steps, and possibly something of return value. And we did this first as manual way, so that we constrained what, what was supposed to be done by that very developer. And, uh, and the, this was kind of software design aspect. The newcomer was meant to write first a Word document from a template, relatively fast to do, but to communicate to the specification makers that this is what we, our logical operation is aiming to do. And this is what we started like 2009. On a, uh, on a summer, 
we started to get the structure of existing pretty large and unstructured code base by just starting to do things differently in a manual fashion. And then we actually learned that just having this kind of logical boxes, even though everything was written manually, a handful of, uh, I mean, every operation is a certain kind of class, and every execution, I mean, they can be in kind of execution, first execution and then second execution, doing some, some kind of logical uh, function call or something like that. Every execution is, uh, uh, is located in very limited area of code, which started to structurize the program in kind of fashion that um, uh, another developer would know where exactly that certain execution is located in a code. And there's nothing, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is done all around, all around the world by different people for, for the very same reasons. So nothing new here in kind of way. But when we started to learn that we can start to estimate work estimations based on how many parameters or uh, how many executions are there, how many operations we have uh, in the design scope or uh, design done but in the manual implementation scope, we kind of realized that uh, we can actually start seeing things from the higher level that, that have a concrete one-on-one -on -one mapping to the code. And uh, we actually first started to do XML kind of schema mapping of this semantic, docu semantic documentation format and started to use that as a calculation. We used plenty of Microsoft's existing tools for that, but then after a few surprises and, uh, and my background for working with the uh, software development tooling before and on Visual Studio, I sparred with my colleagues and we kind of came by accident to a tooling that actually allows us to generate this uh, whole architectural structure for these kinds of things. And this is, I try to kind of overview map how we ended into this uh, uh, automation, this form of automation, it's, uh, it helps to understand what you can do with ADM, although it's so, it seems to be, and it is actually quite similar to many of uh, existing, or, well, existing aside of that one, but existing technologies for achieving the same kind of thing. I'm not sure how many of you are uh, familiar with domain-specific languages, or uh, stuff like that, but basically what you see here, or a model-driven design, or plenty of kind of advanced or high-end software engineering practices, you see many of the features of those uh, methods or design approaches in the ADM, and you can actually compare the things. But uh, uh, for the simplest way, ADM was born to solve uh, kind of replacing the average developer's input where, where it should be completely structural. So we kind of found out few kind of critical pieces of requirements, how the modules should be bent so that they don't introduce any compromises on the, uh, what's being produced. I try to get to the more concrete point. So this whiteboard doesn't work as well as a live whiteboard, I see. But um, basically, the background was to get kind of unified developer experience so that every developer would experience the same kind of interface to the development without constraining or without taking uh, the speed of development away. And uh, we kind of needed to nail this down because the ADM was developed kind of for the requirement of live project trying to control the developers. So we couldn't introduce any additional burden to the project to get this done. So what we, what we kind of found out that that was a practical enough approach to be, appro uh, to be taken use in a, in a real world project. Okay, this, this for the background. Now I try to give you a bit more concrete piece of, uh, how we can start to approach this and what we can do. 
let's let's focus on a common software structure or software architecture. We usually we can divide any kind of software with these kind of building blocks. Does this, do you, without the boxes, do you see this, uh, is this understandable, what I just wrote here? Yes, it is. So if we uh, look any any software application or a system, uh, we can see, it, or any relevant, but we can further on come on to the point where these uh, don't need to be a physical layers at all. But we can see as a, as a taken example of a, of a service layer. So, any modern application has uh, has the cloud or cloud or backend service uh, service based layer where you traditionally have uh, something like return value method these kinds of information defined on the level. That's, uh, that's what you get with the uh, uh, web services, uh, any kind of, well, basically any kind of client-server interaction. You can see the uh, service layer as something like uh, defining kind of interface construct, uh, uh, interface contract on what you need to be calling from the client side and what you need to uh, implement on the backend side. And now if you think of this uh, without much of modern IDE tools, to implement this one, uh, this, I test tried the whiteboard, but it's not working as fluently as I would have hoped. In this side, you have kind of client proxy code. And somewhere in this side, you have a... Uh, it's not actually a proxy code here. But if, you, if we look at this kind of architecture, you have something in, in the service layer that, that creates uh, needs a client proxy codes for, for instance, for the rich client that can be made with like in Java. And then we have uh, another client proxy code here. in Objective C for the iOS, for instance. So we can kind of treat a service layer. <coughs> it's usually abstracted in a way that in, you define your services in, um, in Java or in C Sharp in, in a code fashion, but the frameworks and tools create you a web service layer, and then the IDE tooling Will, will generate you a proxy code for different platforms, depending on that very IDA, uh, IDA tooling. And then if you are working on a fixed project or uh, with any kind of service uh, uh, reference framework, you need to have, you probably have some ruling of how you manage the exceptions, for instance, that come from the business logic or from the uh, database level, so that you don't expose everything directly to the service layer. So you usually have a code around the actual service layer in a very structural fashion. And if you, th if you look at this uh, from how it's approached today, without considering uh, ADM kind of tooling, some tools probably approach it in the same fashion, but usually you need some kind of framework to make this uh, uh, kind of dummy code written in a, as, as little as possible and in a, a, as controlled fashion and tool supported as possible. But those tools and frameworks often come short so that they don't support every platform available. They kind of, you, you make a choose if you make, uh, for instance, Visual Studio tooled Windows Azure backend, you get really fluent experience using uh, Windows Phone client against that one. 
but then you might fall short on uh, using Android clients, of course, uh, unless uh, you rely on the web service tooling. But then you run into different kind of uh, problems that, or not problems, but uh, reasons to write more manual code. Same thing, actually, can be seen in a, in a kind of here. If you separate your database, you might have an object relational mapper here, or you might have a direct SQL calls. And that's also kind of depends what tooling you, you have in use. And usually you have to choose the tooling beforehand. You, you even start to design the application so that you know which platforms you are using. Is this, does this overview of a normal architecture or standard up, up architecture make sense? Any questions or comments at this point? Seems nothing, no questions from Bolzano, at least. Yeah? Uh, other questions from... I see no, no questions from, from, from Turkey. Everything's fine. No questions here. So everything is fine for, uh, for everybody, Kalle. Can you continue? Okay. I, I experienced this. This is not going as fluent as on live whiteboard, but now I try to get to the point. I hope you, uh, this, is, this is bearable in this kind of fashion. Uh, now, when we start to look at live, live software project, somebody needs to write the code where the libraries or frameworks fall short. And when we start to come to area where, uh, where we have, for instance, different mobile clients, uh, let's say we have one client proxy for uh, Objective-C and then another one, For Android, we kind of see monotonously the same kind of work being done on different platforms. Android is actually a good example here in kind of fashion that uh, if you use certain kind of Java structures, uh, you cannot use the same structures with the Android because uh, Android is uh, using, it's running on uh, something called Dalvik, which is a subset of, uh, of full Java. It's not falling short on many aspects, but, uh, but some, some libraries that you use there need to be built against that version. And not, you cannot run uh, all the Java libraries on Android, at least not when we, we did some stuff on that. I might have some old information on that area. But regardless, you kind of need somebody to write out pretty monotonously same kind of stuff with different languages. And now what ADM brings into the picture is that it provides a way to say this, uh, this part, for instance, for service layer, it, it uh, exp uh, introduces a way to define a service layer in just a tiny bit of, uh, above the platform level of abstraction. So we still kind of use the same kind of terminology that we would use when writing the code, but we kind of write it in a platform-neutral fashion. And then we introduce a way to generate the code based on those defin the definitions so that we can actually get this part of multi-platform service calls in a fashion where everything is done by the automation the level where you actually need to start to write the business logic. And how it, how it can do this, I'll try to write it out. We use, based on this, what I tried to explain in the first, first part, we were using, I will actually write it down here as well. We were doing this for a Finnish tax administration project. Or that was kind of the first phase we used the fully tool backed up ADM in a live project. And that environment is, uh, yeah, it's a government tax agency, so it kind of constrains what you can do there in a pretty strict way. So we couldn't introduce by the project uh, any new tooling 
nor libraries, but we got to got the agreement that we can use the Visual Studio code generation and the XML as an industry standard, which we were using in the project elsewhere already. So the artifacts that allow us to do this are as simple as XML schema, XML schema that actually defines the model, then a XML document that's based on the schema that actually defines the services, and then one too many uh, T4 code generators. So we use very, very basic technologies to actually con uh, control and generate the code. Uh, very, well, the widest kind of standard, the XML, and then this D4 is kind of a, what you could consider as a tool-based requirement, but it's very straightforward to use, and it's supported right now in the Visual Studio, and it's an open source equivalent monodevelop. And it's very intuitive to use when, you, when you've used any, or if you have any experience on uh, web templating technologies such as PHP, ASP.NET, I think, J, JSP. I'm not familiar with the Java tooling, so bear with the poor examples on that area, but very, very straightforward and easy to use code generator. And we kind of found a way to package these ones something that we call an abstraction. So we kind of found a way that we can start to modularize blocks from higher level of abstraction. So we can have one abstraction that's taking care of this uh, service layer, not trying to generate the UI code on the mobile device, for instance, but simply taking care of the service layer alone. Then we can have another abstraction that's taking care of the business logic so that it, it's a structural way. It becomes cross-platform uh, portable or uh, can be run in a distributed fashion without having, uh, having a framework to back it up or kind of specific experience required tooling or libraries. And same thing for the database layer. And uh, this is kind of why it's... Uh, it's important to see ADM as something that you can replace a manual coder's work because libraries and frameworks, while they almost get you there, they often start to introduce first a bit silent compromises and then when you try to combine a libraries with another library that's providing you a different path, you run into heavy compatibility issues. But because ADM provides a way for you to replace the manual coding as anybody would write it by hand, even using, using libraries or abstractions from the li uh, sorry, abstractions from an existing library allows you to modify them on the fly to kind of tailor them together. And even, even in the environment, then if you realize that you are over automating something, you can always revert back to existing tooling or existing manual work. So <clears throat> it probably becomes more concrete when I start to show you what it does in practice, but basically we kind of use the constraints that we uh, define XML schema for the model, then we say our stuff in the XML, and then we have really easy to use template generators to make it real. And that, that's the core requirement to automate anything in the software development uh, kind of software developers uh, context. And I, uh, I would like to focus first on this one and then drive onwards to demonstrate that we can automate pretty much more, for instance, documentation from the software as well, or cross-link things in a fashion that you really cannot do uh, without manual coding by other, other means. Any questions now or comments?
Not, not for the moment here in Bolzano. Okay, HR group is typing something. Okay, uh, how do you want to, uh, how many of you are running Visual Studio? Would you like to me to first show you all around there and then dive into the more detailed questions if somebody is already test driving it or uh, how do you want to play it? Yeah, we could do that. So, if I try to walk slow enough in the Visual Studio so that if you follow, you might be able to follow later on, or... Uh, Okay, okay. Based on the, if you go with the agile group, is suggesting that uh, as you. As the Visual Studio is uh, unfamiliar to most of you, or at least enough of you, I try to move slowly on that area. I'll show you around, and then we can use time later on. I'll, uh, I can help you to find your way out of there. <laughs> out of there, not out of there, but uh, your way within the tool where you start to find things. We have pretty ground-up demonstrations of the things in the Visual Studio, available in videos as well, so... <laughs> And everything I show you here is kind of uh, 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 already available as a download. Let me try to share the Visual Studio environment. Okay, we are beginning to... Is everybody seeing the screen okay now? It's still loading, so I'm waiting. Okay, that's good. Good to... That's an <laughs> important to see. Yeah, say when it's loaded. Because I'll slow down the pace on moving here. If, if it's loading slowly and I move too fast here, you have no clue what I'm doing. And uh, it kind of misses the point. Can, do you see the chat messages same, same time as uh, my full screen? Or can, if somebody is starting to lag, I cannot much follow if I see, if, if I don't hear their voice at all. Do you see the screen now? Yes, we do here in Bolzano. Okay. How fast, if I move here to the different file, how fast do you see the change? It's pretty fast. Pretty fast for Bolzano. Let's wait for other people here. Okay. I try to move relatively slow, so, <coughs> so that if, if the screen is loading slower, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through through the first the actual physical service and then through how the ADM starts to realize it. I'll scroll a bit down. Um, we have a, actually, this is a Visual Studio standard solution uh, with multiple projects in it. Uh, in Visual Studio context, the solution is kind of, uh, I think it's quite equivalent to Eclipse's uh, workspace in kind of fashion that uh, it's a combination of, of uh, projects that you are building from that perspective, kind of. Let me see. Oh, okay. I try to follow the chat, so uh, when, I, when you write something, oh, let me scroll a bit so that I can see. Yeah, yeah, we, we are writing, uh, but uh, we don't want to stop you at all, but really we were using uh, the chat. 
Ah, okay, okay. But it's a good, good to if you can voice out the comments or uh, if the well, if Daniel or somebody can filter them, I'm I'm happy to try to. Yeah, Kale, I'm joining the, the the conference with my computer as well, so I can see the chat list and we can continue to just project uh, okay. your, your video here. Okay. So I will take a look at uh, the chat list. So I will, uh, in, in case I interrupt you, is uh, if I see people uh, asking okay. what. Our idea was different from a stop uh, cut from his uh, description. So it was only just uh, we don't understand. No. <laughs> Sandro, also known as the father, we cannot hear you really. <laughs> Okay, but I, I'll continue then. But answering to that question, this is uh, uh, in this this demonstration we have the actual client server uh, layer defined. I'll, so I'll kind of walk you through the abstraction that's realizing that very part of software architecture. And then when we walk bit by bit here and show how it's uh, what kind of information it's using as an input, we can then refine that this very abstraction is kind of universal universally reducible in its current form already to define every application uh, having a network service layer, basically. But then, of course, it, it doesn't have to be this very abstraction, but kind of a, that we can derive multi-platform approaches building on top of and expanding what I'm showing you here in the in currently in C-sharp and in kind of .NET environment first. So we have uh, a project, two, two, actually three relevant projects in here. I'll show you quickly, or not quickly, but briefly them. Uh, or actually a bit more. Let me actually show you what I have here all the way so it doesn't confuse you. This is an ADM demo solution that you get from the GitHub. I'll, uh, I'll show you the link later. I've separated in the structure... Uh, solution folder, it's kind of a logical folder, not visible or physical necessarily, that, that separates the actual abstractions away from the actual applications. And this is the way we usually uh, have, have separated the abstraction usage or ADM usage from the actual live code. So we kind of still treat them as a, as a very humble automated developers participating in the project. So we only use them as a, as a kind of engine that produces source code that we can build as if it was a manually written. So this is what you start to see in other demonstrations. Now in, the, in this VCF service ADM demo, this is what I crafted for the Microsoft uh, Spring, Spring Seminar session. It's again within that folder, it's separated in the in the abstractions and the actual code that's using the abstractions. So I'll, uh, I'll run you through this solution structure to the end and then start to show the code. Within the abstractions, we have uh, two abstractions right now. Actually, it's, uh, it's two versions of the same abstraction. The, this demo is made of in kind of way that uh, this is incomplete, completely incomplete abstraction, this service layer ABS. It's just a stub for, uh, for something that you can try hands-on building. It has empty files basically within, and it's explaining uh, it's, uh, it's just structured properly so that it can be built step by step. Then we have the same abstraction here. Uh, in the individual studio project fashion that's being completed. So this is what I'm going to use to play around a bit, show you how we can define uh, the uh, higher level abstraction and how, we, how the tooling runs it so that it's, uh, it's generating the code in a fashion that we want. And these are the parts within the actual kind of ADM's abstraction parts. Now, <clears throat> Then we, the remaining three projects form up what you would co could consider a manually crafted client-server uh, 
layer, or uh, actually it can be, of course, a complete application, but it's focusing on the fact that we have some kind of service interface, which is a separate project. It's basically containing uh, definitions for the service, then we have a client that's actually a console mode application calling that service, uh, kind of web server service, and then we have a service, the web, actual web server service, that's it being called. So we have a full project, very small one, that's treating, that's serving a web service through this uh, service demo project, and that's having a very simple client that's calling the service. And the third project, this demo service interface, is uh, this is a way for uh, how you can do this in .NET, probably the same kind of fashion uh, available elsewhere. This is a library that says the common things for both sides in kind of way that it agrees the data types you are using, it agrees for the uh, actual service interface that the server is using, uh, sorry, client is using and the server is providing. So I walk you through the code-wise quickly how .NET does this kind of thing, and then ex then come to the demonstrating how we can call it, and then wrap it up on how ADM can be used to automate this kind of service generation. Do you still hear my voice? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. So. If the code you are going to show us is still little, so there are still few lines of code, can you zoom just one level more so we can see it better on the projected wall, on the wall? Yeah. Yeah, that's really better for us now. Is this better now? Yes, it is. Okay, good. I can easily zoom to this level, and then I just know that I zoom two steps up. I can zoom even more. The code is really, really kind of small area. But if this is good, I'll then zoom always to this level. So this is okay. Yes, this is okay, Kale. Okay. So <clears throat> this is example of how you do in a modern .NET uh, co code declared service. So uh, what you see in code wise here on these ankle brackets are attributes that you can use to kind of in, in, introduce metadata level stuff on your code. And the .NET technology framework uses these attributes to refine the stuff that it needs, for instance, to uh, provide web service information. I mean, standard web service uh, description language information and all that stuff what the whole SOAP stack is providing. So we have a service contract that's uh, actually the name of the service. Then we have operation contracts for each of the methods that, that the service is providing. And uh, in a technical and also kind of logical way, to be able to provide this service on any programming language or any, any environment, you basically need to know the service name, which here would be kind of this one, uh, or a derivative from this one, and then the method names with the very exact types so that you can actually call them. So in this case, this is a manually written code that's introducing the service. Then I'll, uh, I'll go to the client side the code to actually call that service. We have here a demo service client code. This is actually more cumbersomely done now than what the .NET libraries and the Visual Studio tooling provides, but basically the same elements are found there. It's now just written out in a pure code. How would we call, uh, call the get data? So here is kind of the proxy call, the client side call to call some method from the, from the layer. So it's usually named with the same name, then it introduces some kind of uh, protocol level stack to actually call the service. Here it uses basic HTTP binding and a certain endpoint address. Then it creates uh, with the actually library tooling that's provided by the .NET uh, proxy demo service. And in that service, it finds the method and makes the call. So 
proxy client class would be requiring these uh, six lines of code for every method call introduced by the backend. And why do why you don't you often see these as the modern IDEs? Uh, they tend to create the proxies on the fly. That's at least with the Visual Studio environment. But I anticipate that probably much of the same stuff is happening in the modern Java tools as well. Then on the backend side, so now I was on the client server, client side. Now on the server side, in the .NET, I have to introduce some class for the service, then the actual uh, interface for that, and then introduce the public methods that actually uh, implement the interface. So uh, for those people not familiar with C-sharp interfaces, you can think of them as, uh, uh, from the C++ C++ terms, they are kind of abstract classes. So you inherit something which don't, doesn't have any implementation. And then you can, of course, typecast to your object to that kind of uh, uh, interface or, uh, or a type to see those methods. So I think Java has equals for interfaces. But uh, uh, in the C++ world, this is kind of uh, partially uh, virtual or abstract classes in kind of way. So we have, uh, in an object-oriented way, implementation for each of the methods that were introduced in the layer. Is this something, can you follow up of this, uh, does this make any sense up to this point? Questions? Seems it is fine for for everybody. Unfortunately, Baris is not able to, to follow the video, but uh, as we are trying to fix this thing, uh, he asked us to continue and not worry. Okay. Uh, the video in case. Uh, just to let people know from Bolzano, if you have a question, just turn your face to me and, uh, and uh, alert me, so I will, in case, interrupt uh, Calde. And uh, I am continuing to monitor the, the chat, so... Just, you can continue. Okay, good. So basically, <clears throat> I'll show you a code what calls this one. It's a, in the client demo. There are a few completely bogus method calls. But uh, for instance, this first line is calling that service call that I just showed you in the demo service. So I'll actually run the solution once. I'll put a breakpoint here. Actually, another one there, just in case. So this is the client program side. And then I'll go to the server side. So it's the get data. I actually already have here a breakpoint. So I should get a debugger to notify me and show me when the code is trying to call that one. And then I run the debugging mode solution the solution in debugging mode. So it comes, this is now on the client side. It's making, going to make the call for the client data with that kind of, uh, sorry, demo service client for the get data method. I'll, uh, I'll let it run. Oops. Let's put that one away. I let it continue, which means that uh, if my debugger is properly configured, it should fire up the server and process pretty soon. It's starting up the server now. So now it's actually debugging two sites running two different processes in the same debugger session. So it's now on the server side making the call from the client. There was actually a network call in between. And then I let this one run and it gets back to the client side again to make another call. So very kind of standard 
or a very stupid uh, kind of but technically standard way of making service calls. Now I start to show you how we can start <coughs> automating this one or defining it in a different fashion in the ADM. I have separated in the project area uh, uh, in, the, in the actual projects. So to remind you again, uh, it's easier to see ADM as something completely separate from the manual software process where you only use its outcome as if, as if it would be a code from very uh, humble and productive developer but relatively stupid one. So it does exactly what you said it to do and doesn't innovate anything. So in these, in these buildable projects that could be handmade and have the handmade code as that, why, that I just showed you, I have a separate folder that's linking with the, the arrow means here in this icon that it's actually using the source from other location. And that's how we can link stuff from outside the project's folders to be built within the project. So in the demos where you see these ADM folders, it means that the content within here is something that's been produced by the automation part of the program or the, uh, of, of the development. So I have in every of these projects, I have a folder that's defining the area where I actually get uh, uh, automation code in and if you see the if you notice notify the uh, file names that that's been used here here is a in the serv service side server side demo we have a service server c sharp uh, version 1.0 designer cs then on the client demo we have a service client c sharp and again the designer cs and uh, in the interface demo, again, a different file. So basically, if I open one, it's a, well, that's a one, one drawback of the current tooling that I use. It doesn't align the code. But basically, it's kind of a humble, but not that uh, pure writing guise of code. But you can treat this kind of the same way that you would treat a manual code, except that it's always exact to, uh, to the generator. So the interface is kind of technically equivalent the automation outcome to what we had uh, in a manual version that I showed you to begin with. Then if, I, uh, if we look at the uh, client demo side, if you recall this uh, demo service client where is this uh, block of code for every method, same thing is repeated in the automation code for each method call. So in here we have actually equivalent of get data, but then we have also another method of say hi, which again introduces the basic structure of the code exactly the same, but it has then uh, replacements for the naming tags for the backend calls to match what was there. And same thing for the, for the server side as well. So here, Every kind of interface introduced method is also implemented here as if, as if it was manually written, but then it's uh, actually pushing up the actual implementation to happen elsewhere. So this is kind of <clears throat> one example of how we can separate the generated code from the manually written one. The automation does not expect you to write code in the same file that it's producing, but it's simply uh, directing the execution outside of the uh, actual file. I'll show this more in the hands-on when we introduce a new method and see how it goes. So this is the way you see how we inject the automation code to the very buildable projects. They kind of are treated as uh, code artifacts. They just happen to come from the automation and not from manual developer. It's a... Uh, I've... I've uh, kind of experience that it's easiest way to understand that we can do anything that the manual developer can do. Although some, some, sometimes it requires more trickery on the template generator side, but we don't have the traditional kind of constraints uh, when we think of that if, if manual developer could do it in the manual fashion, 
then we can do it in the automated fashion as well. So then I, now I start to show you what the ADM module that's producing this code is all about. I'll uh, go to the actual file system because it might be easier to understand from that perspective. So you don't have to be bound with the uh, Visual Studio environment. Before you show us the magic, Mikko, you are still with us? Yes. Okay, very well. Okay. Any questions now? Yeah, any questions? Okay, we are ready to see the magic. Tell them. Okay, it's, it looks really stupid. It's not, there is no magic or shiny buttons. It's really dull. Uh, everything is located. One of the... I'll actually introduce or list the critical aspects why we can pull certain things off with this approach that have been a bit difficult or impossible basically before. Uh, because ADM had, uh, was born in an environment where it should be able to replace and unreplace, so uh, replace a manual developer and replace him back so that we, we, don't, we cannot introduce any kind of compromise that wouldn't be justified to be taken off for any, well, any kind of business decision maker, maker's decision. So we kind of had to make the artifacts completely version controllable and completely separated so that when the automation is stopped, we simply start using the outcome of last automation run as if, as if it was a manual written code and then we don't, just don't ever run the automation again. So one of the, one of the, uh, a design, design kind of approaches require that we isolate everything within physical file system folder. It's critical requirement from the perspective that if you do source code branching and merging and that kind of stuff, controlled fashion of uh, source code, kind of standard version controlling features, you can separate your, uh, you know that your ADM stuff is in a very specific location. So you can rip off that whole folder and your abstraction is go gone, or you can introduce new abstractions simply by pulling them in in a certain structure in the file system. In the early stages, we actually had this split on few file, a few folders, but then it became apparent that it needs to be under one so that version controlling schemes work uh, as fluent as possible. So with, within the file system, then we have, uh, these are Visual Studio artifacts of building. Don't have to care about those at all. Same thing for properties. So if you are not familiar with the Visual Studio folder structure, this is uh, something that the tooling automatically gives. We only are ex focusing right now on this uh, service layer folder. And right now we've named the abstraction folder based with the same naming. I've used the ABS extension for the abstractions. There are a few other extensions. I'll explain them tomorrow better. But uh, right now we focus on the same named folder. In the folder we have uh, things. I'll skip this one. This looks blo more bloated here, the Visual Studio. We have a content folder that's defining a normal XML schema and in this case also XML content that's uh, following that schema. And then we have one particular uh, code generation artifact. I'll explain that, that one uh, later uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But uh, now we focus only on the schema and the XML first. So in Visual Studio, the structure is exactly the same. We have here the XML schema and the XML content. And in here, we have the TT files that are actually template generator files for each of those that I uh, introduced earlier on, on the outcome of the code. So we have one generator that generated the client proxies that you saw before, the client proxy areas, and same things for the interfaces, service contract, and for the server. And this is basically the file system structure. Now I walk you through 
the XML content, how we start to define the uh, service layer and how we can get effectively and kind of productive fashion of generating the template, uh, doing the template-based code generation uh, from that uh, model. So this is kind of the magic. This is kind of uh, anticlimax of the system. It's uh, the tooling is kind of very standards based, so it's not too shiny, but uh, it kind of fights off the uh, constraints that we, if we use certain very modern UML here, it would probably constrain us more to use certain kind of tooling, than try to introduce certain kind of high-end approach that then would be compromised to some other people. So even though the XML starts to look for as a dull and uh, kind of un un unpolished or unfinished approach, it's kind of a baseline that actually fits for most of people as it is. Let me see. Oh, I'm actually... So I open this XML now with the out of us tooling, show it more proper what it's made of. This was actually open here already. This is something, now that I, I don't get the live commenting, but uh, this is something that most people that I faced with uh, are not familiar with. You don't. It's, it wasn't that common to have any kind of XML schema de design uh, experience from all the people that I've, I've came uh, bumped into when introducing them to the ADM. And I wasn't actually myself even experienced with XML schema design. So it kind of, it's something that people, most people need to learn. Uh, learn in the process. But basically, using visual tooling such as out of us makes it really easy and really straightforward. And uh, <clears throat> the best uh, kind of argument for why I would really recommend using visual tooling is that when you get accustomed to it, it starts to replace what you usually use UML kind of visualization tooling for. So if I walk through with the model in this visual, by the way, is this uh, font large enough or do you want me to zoom this one up? I don't see any reaction on the chat list. Yes, at least in Calgary they can see. Okay, I can zoom a bit up. I was worried that I lost you. I had a one live meeting session earlier. It was last week and I spoke like 10 minutes. Then I realized that they had lost my audio somewhere in between. <clears throat> so if I walk you through what we have here in the service model right now, we have a... And this is, this is not by ADM specification. You don't need to name the things like we, I've done here. I've just built up a way to do it in kind of structural fashion. But the ADM's idea is not to enforce you to use certain kind of terminology. Although either be, I'd be happy to hear and understand why you would use certain kind of. So it's a kind of agreement of using, using same kind of way of dictating same kind of things so that the other architects uh, recognize the familiar structures. But I usually name the highest level element as something, as the abstractions name, and then I start to dictate what's in the model. So in here we have an abstraction that const, const, uh, consists of uh, multiple services. All the namings are kind of made in the schema so I could uh, I could say it as clearly as I want. So I have a contract namespace name, client namespace name, a server namespace name. And this is for very technical reasons. The code that is being generated out of this needs to have those namespace names there anyway. So it's a kind of information that in a technical fashion you are going to need when you build the server in manual fashion. So when you raise the abstraction level to handle that information, it needs to be here as well. We could leave it out, but then the template generations would have it hard-coded in a fashion to be able to produce what manual developer would 
and that's why it's uh, you see kind of more information here that you traditionally see in the uh, some of the service service introductions. Then in the uh, actual service, we have uh, under the service services, we have a. Uh, <coughs> Under the namespaces, sorry, it's a plural, we have multiple services where we have a name, and then on each of the service we can have, oops, it's zooming a bit bad, we can have one too, one too many methods. And again, within the method, we have a, at minimum the name, possibly the return value type, if it's left out it's kind of treated as void, and then we have from no, zero to uh, any amount of parameters, again with minimum, minimum information, name and the data type. So this is the XML schema defining the service and its methods. Then we have uh, in a .NET implementation, and basically of course applies to every manual implementation as well, uh, we have something as composite types. So we can have uh, Primitive, primitive, primitive types would be integers uh, in uh, .NET environment, date times, doubles, uh, might be bytes and characters. And then we can have uh, custom types returned if we introduce them in the service layer and introduce them properly in the client and server proxies. So the, in the abstraction model, we've also provided a way to define a composite types. So it's a, it's a basically um, class plus model information, it has the name, it's going to go in the same namespaces as, as the services itself, so the composite type itself doesn't have a namespace name. Then it has the properties, one too many with the name and the data type. So you basically look like, look an information that's uh, uh, pretty similar to what you have a class definition if you, out, uh, if you leave out the inheritance structure. So this is the schema model for the uh, for the actual abstraction, higher level abstraction. Then, if you are not that familiar with the XML schema, I'll show you the actual XML that's using the schema. So here we have uh, the same schema that's uh, the or uh, XML recognizing the same schema. So basically the same information that we see in the automation generation outcome. And I'll actually, I'll actually modify this service a bit and run the automation once I've showed to you so that I show you where the automation ends and the manual work stops. So let's assume that uh, we are users of existing abstraction. We know that we need to make a new method for this service. In, in a normal environment or an ADM environment, there needs to be some kind of uh, guidance of how we make a method for a service if we are to follow the guidelines of the project that we are working for. ADM kind of outcomes this by using the XML constraints and the schema for that. So we kind of, uh, as a new developer, we kind of need to learn that there is a services abstraction somewhere, and then we follow the schema by, the, uh, by its uh, kind of guidance to provide the method. So <clears throat> the actual intelligence comes to help here. It starts to, it only allows us to say the, say the very, very those terms that are required by the method definition to be uh, actual, I mean, uh, to be right ones. And this is one of the approaches. I'll actually show you the guidance aspect. So let's, if we now move to the area where we are using existing abstraction as a fresh developer, we can give more guidance with the XML schema tooling by introducing or using the XML annotations. I'll jump a bit, but I'll show you the same, same time the kind of end developer experience of guidance in the system. So, I'll go to the schema and edit its annotation a bit. So 
So if the schema for some reason is not uh, kind of implicitly understandable, we can use very standard features of the XML schema to start annotating the actual XML form. And in the developer experience, it means that when that one would be uh, checked into the system and somebody uh, by the architect, for instance, guiding the developer, the developer would pull off a new version in the version control because he was unsure how the method would be used and he would immediately get the additional documentation on that area of how, the, uh, how and why she, uh, he or she would be using the method here. So we can start. Kalle, there's a question from Kaljari. Uh, can you split an XML in different files? Uh, yes, yes, you can, yeah. Yeah, because now it seems like, I mean, at the moment you are looking at only an XML that is related to open classes, I think you can connect with a particular instruction. I like, uh, I'm importing. Uh, Alessandro, please write it down very quickly and I will, and I will say it. Sorry, right, sorry, no problem. <laughs> okay, uh, please go on, Cal. Yeah. I, w I will try to manage to collect some questions uh, for after the workshop and then. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to speed up a bit too. Now I'm, I guess I'm showing a bit too, because I, these are good questions. I want to address these uh, really good stuff, because I think I, I know what he is asking. So let me pull this one off. Uh, I'll now demonstrate how you use an abstraction, what kind of experience you get with the done abstract, abstraction, show you quickly how you make one, and then let's, tra let's start... Um, wrapping off the questions and get to the open discussion. So this is kind of, uh, if I don't know anything about methods, but I, I just know the requirement specs, for instance, demo test for this case, and then I don't introduce a return value at all. I just know, okay, let's actually, return value would be, let's put something out, and uh, integer to uh, convert, in this case, a parameter of int. And I simply introduce a stupid method, demo, demo converter test, for instance. That's going to return value string, uh, have a parameter named with integer to convert, and its data type is int. Now, uh, I'll run the transformation of all the templates in the project here. So I actually enforce uh, all these TT files to generate the code from the XML. So it kind of uh, is doing the dummy developers work on the proxy level all the way up to the implementation of the actual logic. And what happens, I don't get any errors here, but now when I try to build the solution, I should get one error. It's because the server-side generator that's supposed to make the server-side call made its work as it did before, which means that it's now calling a logic that's not yet there. So I allow to uh, create the stop for me. And if I'm, con if I'm being considered as a newbie or rookie developer, I wouldn't have to understand anything about how many layers of, uh, how, how I have to distribute my server code in a three different projects, in d three different files to get a client server call made but I just get to the point where automation is dictating me that now I need to implement this one by manually, uh, by hand. So then I write some, some code here, converted plus integer to convert, save and build again. So basically, 
if you, this is why it's also better to understand ADM as replacing a developer. It's kind of an incomplete automation that requires, that requires the manual code to be in sync of what your automation is producing. So now when I did implement this one, I'll, uh, I'll put a breakpoint there. I go to my client server demo in the program file where I had this uh, silly cause of nothing. And I write the new one, demo response is ADM service client, sorry, ADM completed service client. And here we already see the demo converter test that the automation provided. I put some data there. Fake point. And of course, when running the demo, well, this is the first one. Now, when I let it run from here, I get to our manual code. In a, in a kind of very straightforward fashion, if I go to the call stack, I see the one frame above that's calling is now this ugly automated code. So it's, uh, it's not even uh, as difficult to understand as some libraries or frameworks would where you have to understand first how the calls are routed when we are dealing with the automation generated content. I'll have another question from Calgary. What if by mistake we use two methods with the same name inside a, an XML file or a big XML file? It can happen. Uh, does a, at least a warning uh, at compile time exist? Uh, uh, if I understand the question correctly, if you, if you use kind of a, a illegal name there, so in case, for, for instance here, do you mean kind of that I, by accident, introduce two methods with the same name, this kind of a case? Or if I have, uh, I could have uh, another completely invalid thing here, or even here. Yes, this is what I mean, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yes. Yeah, this is kind of uh, also how it's not overburdening you with any kind of validation. You can validate that thing if you want, but by default, if you treat it as a manual developer, it's really, really humble and down the line following your specifications. So when I run the generators and try to build it now, it just produced me a code which is completely crappy because it kind of uh, refines, it, it takes the information from that level as is right now. So, <clears throat> uh, in comparison of what you usually see in the, uh, mm, what's the, this uh, MDA, Model Driven Architectures, I think if that's, uh, or, uh, or design, uh, kind of design focused approaches where they actually control much more of the code generation output. You might have been familiar with the validation items, but in here you don't have to do it. It's a, you can do it. it we actually, it will fall probably shorter than what you've experienced on those areas. But the power comes from the fact that um, if I show you the actual generators, now this is bit poor, let me see. The actual generators are very straightforward. For instance, what was the one that was broken here? Service contract line 21, coming from that it's a operation contract with its name and then some parameters. In the TT file, if I go here, it's actually doing very straightforward replacements of return value, method name, and parameter declarations in a very readable fashion. So if I make this kind of modif modification to the template, save it, and look at the outcome, it's on the fly modifying the outcome of the code generation. 
I'll, uh, I can dig to this question more deeper, but this is, did this answer the question? Uh, they were already satisfied. Let's see if they are still. Yes, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yeah. That's a good question, in kind of a, because it, it, that's, that's one of the reasons why it's, uh, it's best to be treated the out outcome of the ADM, of the kind of responsibility of the template maker. That's how you can connect it to the way that, okay, this guy would, if, it, who, if, he, if he would do this kind of typo, he could do it in the code as well. So it's kind of a statical compiler will help to find these kinds of things. Which now comes to the, uh, I'll show you quickly, really quickly, I'm a bit uh, distracting myself even here, sorry about that. I'll, I'll show you really quickly on how this comes so productive from the template generator side. I'll use this uh, operation contract for one example. It's, uh, it's, it's generating the constructs uh, for introducing the methods. Let's say that we we would have to, I'll modify a bit that our declaration and show how fast we can reflect it to the generators. So let's say that uh, we, we would need an asynchronous method call to be introduced in this level or something, some other additional parameter, but let's, let's pretend we have something that asynchronous method call. How would we modify it or introduce it in the model would be that uh, I'll open this one again with the XML spy. I first modify the thing in the uh, actual XML schema. So I go to the method type declaration of, of the XML schema. I'll introduce here a new attribute. Let's say it's a custom demo async. Or oh, not even attribute, but let's make it kind of this kind of ex example tag, for instance. So it's something that we can toggle on. I'll use normal schema tooling for defining it as a boolean. And then I actually keep it as op optional, make its default value false. Let's annotate it even. Solution. Uh, async implementation. But I want to demonstrate here that we are no, by no means bound by anything as using some generic terms here. We can, in a very pro, pro, project specific area, if we are bound by customers' requirements, subcontracting or something like that that doesn't allow us on the fly to alter the design, we can we can accept the terminology that, that's been com coming from there. Or if we are using on, a, for instance, our taxation agency project was uh, in Finnish language only. Uh, so everything we used ADM4 was completely in Finnish language. But still, of course, we can then map elsewhere on the, or at the kind of XML level, the, the, them to match on the English ones if we have the proper alternatives there. But I'll introduce a new flag here in the model, something like custom demo async flag. I'll first save here the uh, schema. Then I go back to the Visual Studio, open the XML content that's following that schema. And now I should have here already kind of way to declare that additional functionality to my code or if it was a documentation, do you, anywhere where I would want to use this one. I'll tomorrow show more on how we can start generating documentation and status reporting out of this same information. But I'll, uh, I'll go and put it in the say hi, it would be true. On the default, it would be false. I'll also actually broken one as well, but in here I'll uh, put it as false. So basically the XML schema is dictating, at the, as I defined, in where it's not said at all, it's, uh, it's written as false by default. And actually, I usually use the annotation in a fashion like this. 
us to satisfy that because XML IntelliSense shows that that it's uh, this default value is visible for the user of the abstraction as well. So now when I go back to Visual Studio and see the annotations, it shows me that this, this value is optional. A practical requirement because the intelligence doesn't make any difference here. So now I did introduce a new value here so that in my XML I can start to say things differently. Now, I run one little custom tool here that's actually doing very simple uh, serialization structure of that XML. It's the one TT file that you saw before. And why do I need to do that one is that uh, I'll close this one and reopen the service contract C sharp that we just looked before go back to the area where I had this uh, operation contract here and uh, in here I have actually the oh it's slow I have actually the intelligence support for recording structures up to the point that it actually updates on the fly the things that I update in the model it means that basically we can alter the model in very productive fashion. The second we know that we need to have here uh, the attribute for uh, asynchronous operation, we can start introducing here a bit more logic to the generator that starts to be conditional based on the, on the variable, for instance. So I just introduce here a conditional conditional clause that if, uh, if this is defined, we output this one. Otherwise, we don't output anything here. Just an exam example of uh, how straightforward it is to alter the generator and the model to get the kind of custom code there. Then I save the template and look at the outcome. And we should have, uh, in the say hi, we have these modifications because it's XML said that it's a custom ASIC operation. But for the, all the others, they are still kind of intact. Of course, even more ugly now, though, because the generator is, in this example, with poor demonstration, it's adding a new empty line there. So this is um, trying to wrap it up. It, it could use a better demonstration of how you start using these. I'm starting to run out of time. I can expand a bit when we go to the uh, or explain it better later. Uh, the one reason that we can start kind of radical model changes and generator changes is based on the fact that everything that you see here is version controlled. So we can even branch a different version of this whole solution, make these kind of modifications on the fly, and as long as our manual code is in sync. So I could even change the syntax here in kind of fashion that it breaks all the method calls on the server side. But if I just rename the calls in the manual code, before I check in or commit the changes, everything would be constantly in sync. So that's why, again, it's, uh, it's worthwhile to see, uh, uh, co compare the ADM's functionality of something that anybody could do in a manual code in comparison. Okay. Uh, I think now would be good to start to have questions and where you get guide how do you what what do you want to see more at this level and uh, where do you want to there's a quest a pretty long question from Calgary so I ask you to, to read it uh, instead yeah let me see uh. Uh, 
No, it's not too long. Let me try to read it in my words. So, uh, is this, uh, We know there are tools to convert UML classes in Java files. The difference is that you put the general code inside a method in the XML. That code is shown in real code too. Okay, uh, I don't properly, I can try to under, uh, answer in a few fashion ways and then you can re-ask re the question. Um, you can have a real code within the XML content if you want. It's, uh, it's actually the template doesn't care what's going through. We use that kind of approach of automating series of unit tests. Uh, if, if the manual developer is to write that code, it's, uh, it's not that productive as it might be. So we, we have had an experience where we used ADM first to automate something and then we stopped using it because of, uh, uh, of the major area of the code was the manual code and it was not so productive to be copy-pasted on the XML all the time. Mm. However, if you were to deploy a cross-platform solution, then it starts to be a viable option if you want to distribute uh, different targeting abstractions. Then you could, for instance, have the XML contain the actual implementation level code as well. And then if you are referring to comparison what UML tooling can provide, uh, this is probably a bit similar or a lot similar. If you want to use existing tooling, you can probably plug in ADM to some level to benefit from the kind of structural genera generation. But uh, if the if the question is where you where you would use existing tooling and where you would use ADM, that would then be about how major major your pro project is and uh, how. Uh, how accustomed your existing team is to use your tooling now and how much kind of future migrations or changes you are anticipating to see. Did this answer any of uh, these questions? Some aim, <clears throat> but if uh, if I follow up to this earlier one about if you have can have multiple XML files coming in, uh, in this basically the structure, if you consider what logically happens, is that we have a XSD that defines the schema uh, of of our XML. We actually, I've ha I have few examples where I use multiple XML files myself, even even for simple abstractions. But especially when we can, when we have transformations of things, I'll try to use whiteboard to explain it. That, that's where it comes relevant immediately. So where the power starts to come in, mm, let me see if I can have a new whiteboard. This is what I can show better tomorrow. Uh, we can have here... Uh, Class model definition operation model. So kind of universal blocks of how you can define any kind of program. Then we can have a documentation apps. This would be class model apps. This would be operation. If I use the same names that I used before uh, uh, in, a, in a concrete abstractions. We have two abstractions, one for logical operations, one for class model, kind of uh, defining any kind of class, uh, programming class. Then we have a documentation abstraction, status tracking abstraction. And then do I have anything that helps me to draw? We can have a transformation that provides from the class model and the operation model something that then in the documentation abstraction will actually generate a Word doc file. And then 
when we start to status track things, we simply introduce a way in the XML to say the status of a thing. In this fashion, we would do it in kind of, let me pull it off in a very ad hoc demo. We could have here a method in the method where I just introduced a custom demo async flag. We could have here also something like... Sorry, Kali, what was the last thing you were drawing? Sorry. Uh, documentation ABS, then there is an arrow, and then I cannot read it. Ah, oh, this one, sorry, I'll... Um, a doc, okay, sorry, I, I lost it. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, it's... Um, so it's, uh, instead of source code, it would actually produce documents. So if you look at this abstraction that's defining the method level things, you can pull off a complete documentation of your system. I'm sorry, uh, from, from uh, now I'm jumping a bit. From this set of information, if you know that your code generations is going to generate that exact implementation of course one to one, it's worthwhile to have a document generator that actually helps you to produce exact documentation of your software. And you can guarantee by that way that because you enter the information only in here, that your documents are always up to date with your implementation. So I'll, tomorrow I'll show you this better, but I can, it's easier to me, for me to probably show already in this kind of fashion. I can introduce here kind of project status or completeness status. That's an XML of string type as something like, I we used uh, uh, design approved and then implemented. This is all just XML schema magic. So I have now a new attribute completeness status in the method type, which means that in the XML side, I can start saying things here that they are either under design, design approved, or implemented. I'll demonstrate this further tomorrow. Sorry, Colin. Should we see it now? Uh. Sorry, did... Uh, what do you see now? Oh, sorry. Great. Uh, okay, I'll demonstrate it much better tomorrow. I was doing a lot of demonstrations on the Visual Studio, and of course you are looking only on my whiteboard. Correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, good, nice demo. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I didn't realize that I wasn't sharing full screen anymore. So basically, the good interruption. Basically, what I tried to demonstrate is that we can have something uh, refined as uh, incompleteness status from the operation level, for instance, that's first dictated as something that uh, we have like 10 operations incomplete, in a status tracking wise. And then we have different transformation from here that makes it that as a documentation. And a documentation abstraction is made of things like mm, header, header, <laughs> that contains text and that kind of thing. So it's another XML structure that can be used as a target for transformations. And then we only need one document generator that's realizing this kind of abstraction to a word, word document. And it has nothing to do with the C Sharp or Java or any other coding platform, but it's just refining the same information on a uh, on kind of more human readable fashion. And this is where we actually start to see multiple XML files being passed around. They technically, they are working as is in a kind of input, inputs and outputs of the uh, generators. <clears throat> but uh, the kind of out-of-the-box functionality, what you already get with the command line tooling and the Git things, uh, simply work with multiple XML files being traversed in a kind of build chain of the automation. Uh, 
uh, a question from Calgary. Can we see tomorrow how we can write some uh, some uh, more complex things like inheritance in the X XML file? Mm, so what uh, more complex things such as I missed that one word. Inheritance. Inheritance. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, I can show an approach for inheritance. Basically, it's, it's refined in a way that you can, you can have a complete freedom of inheritance in a way that you could write a manual code and you say the exactly same things in the XML. But when we actually looked at inheritance in, in our project, in the very actually in the taxation office, on the languages that don't support multiple inheritance anyway, uh, when you start to look why would you inherit things, you start to find out that the inheritance is actually an object-oriented way of uh, trying to reuse things in a fashion that it starts to introduce compromises. So in a fashion, we can try to demonstrate or, or demonstrate the inheritance, but usually in an area where you want to have the behavior such as inheritance, you probably might want to uh, see if, if you are actually wanting to have a categorization of your, of your data that you just traditionally see as inheritance when you use a language that has the inheritance features. So it's something that uh, when you start to use ADM for reusability reasons, you can drop off using inheritance on many of the aspects. They, they are fine with the answer. In any case, Kalle, I took the freedom to, to, to tell people here, if there are, if there are non-answered questions after, after eight today, please send them to Kalle email address that you all should have and CC me, please. And we will manage to answer them and discuss about them tomorrow. Uh, do you agree, Kalle? Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. This uh, whiteboard approach works better in the real world. So I hope you got uh, some basic understanding of the whole thing. We ran out of time of properly showing the, uh, the usage of more complex applications or uh, making, making it from scratch. But uh, I hope I can get to address those things more on tomorrow. And we can continue still if there are uh, interests or questions or anything regarding the Visual Studio or, or other parts. The, I, had, I can email you, Daniel, this one. Let me see if I can now share the full screen again. Makes my explanations a bit more understandable. Well, this is basically the same stuff, but uh, you can get the same source code from, oops, from Git that I used here now. And there are other things as well, but of course, it's, uh, tomorrow is relatively soon, so if, well, if anybody has now questions and wants to understand, or problems with Visual Studio or something like that, I'm happy to address those as well. Can you please copy and paste the, the, the Git link uh, in the chat so we can just... Thank you. Because I think that I cannot, I, I cannot provide the video to the participants uh, before tomorrow, so... Yeah, and there are some, some things to configure in Visual Studio, for instance, when debugging a service and a client. So, it's a bit difficult to address all of those, but... Uh, if there are people very new to Visual, or anybody not even new to Visual Studio, just feel free to drop me an email of any issues or uh, with the demos or or how to use certain things. And I try to look from our existing videos more of uh, we have the videos for creating the things from scratch as a bare examples. Uh, I think they are, I, I looked those things up as well, in a kind of, so you can get hands-on stuff to experience the technical bits 
of this thing. Any other questions, Sora? Do you want me to explain anything further on? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, who's, what? who's speaking now? It's, it's Farish from Turkey. Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, maybe I um, was not able to, I mean, fully watch the uh, coding part. By the way, mostly we have a structure that where we define our protocol or some, some not in, in, in an XML file, like a physical uh, for a web service, and you have the client stops and the service stops, and then you, you generate the code for both files, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think some, I put some analogy between them. Of course, the, the, there are some differences, but it's more or less in that sense. Am I right in, in this analogy? Uh, I lost a bit of your uh, your questions um, I'm not sure if uh, the same year I don't know if anybody I tried to rephr rephrase it so uh, Stefan uh, will try to rephrase it and then <laughs> I think he's referring that when we in Java for example when we are designing web services we have also this code generating part where we define simply the whistle and then from the whistle we can generate the server steps with the, all the code for the server and the steps for the client. Yeah, yeah, this is basically equivalent. On, because on some, yeah, we do exactly, the, or the ADM provides the means to do exactly the same. So, <clears throat> and in some cases, I'm uh, not going to the defensive mode. Uh, in some cases, you basically don't gain much compared to what you get from the tooling. So, this is, for instance, in my demo, I actually, if I recall properly, I ripped off something that Visual Studio generates uh, exactly as you described. So the existing tooling has the generators to pull off from the VSDL scripts, but because I wanted to control the process, I simply copy-pasted the structures from the tooling-generated code and replaced the tags where the, uh, where the actual XML content comes in. So it's basically the same. You get the same kind of productivity. Uh, you don't gain much if you only do the Java development and you only do the VSDL sources. So you don't necessarily gain benefit much of anything of making it in ADM. But when you start to connect different platforms to your implementation, then you start to see the power. And of course, if somebody has already made the ADM module for that uh, Java generator, then it's it's basically immediately usable if you want to use it for uh, replacing the VSDL approach. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a VSDL approach, but you can target any native language, embedded systems, all kinds of things with even C or assembler targeting language. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, this was what I was trying to um, yeah, come. I was trying to arrive. So you're talking about the collaboration, so about the development process. So. I mean, I solve on a presentation of technology, so it's just like a Lego, right? So you just build on top of, you can build on top of other stuff, other stack. So, uh, so you have, uh, I mean, review uh, and apps, the, uh, a very central concern of your technology. So, uh, were you able to hear that, Hello? I was able to hear all the, but the, the second last word. So basically, you were asking that, uh, that uh, about the reusability and the modularity of the approach. But then I missed the last, the question about the concern part. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the, I mean, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, I think this is a central concern, right? So, uh, all of maybe... Um, it, I mean, it's some sort of abstract reuse so that you can reuse uh, the things you make when you compositions, you want to uh, structure other compositions, you can 
use those structures, so you build on top of them. So my question is the process. So what will be the most benefit of using this technology to have multiple agents or multiple uh, teams of, of multiple projects, multiple development teams? So what will be, the, I mean, from a processual point of view, what most advantages part of that technology? Okay, I, yeah, I think I got it. Got it. <clears throat> mm. Well, basically, you can look at it's it's something that we were probably going to learn in the when we start to work together on this uh, immediate immediate uh, kind of uh, steps that you can see is that if if you start to have a agreed declaration for the client service layer, you can start having somebody to pull off a generator for say uh, uh, some embedded Linux deployment and suddenly all the clients that are that are using that abstraction can start to reuse uh, the, the software stack without understanding anything about that uh, Linux particular Linux protocol stack for instance that's something that when you recognize the familiar or common uh, software architectural blocks you can start to take benefit from then the other part that's uh, even Big, much bigger productivity is that when you start to reuse things on just just a bit a higher abstraction level, you can start sharing information or class models because you can rely that your generators will will uh, implement them on any supported platform. And uh, because of chosen approach of everything being source control uh, form and textual form, it means that you can actually fork from the Git your version of our abstraction, introduce a new generator, publish your own version on your git, or make a pull request for hours or patch for hours. But it means that you can freely clone a repository and make an, just a tiny change that you need to plug it into your reusability use. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, the reusability is something that I've learned that you probably need to get a bit more or, or hands-on enough that you understand that you can let go of the libraries. You can let go of uh, common binaries and common frameworks and still have the really rich reusability because you can rely that the other end of the abstraction that it's calling a different code, that the code is going to come from different abstraction again and the co it compiles fine in the final solution. Okay. Are you satisfied with the, with the answer? Yeah, I was able to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would say that that's all for, for today because I... I want to... Uh, other questions than I saw from Mik uh, Mikko. Some question. <coughs> yeah, uh, we received uh, two questions from uh, from Mikko. Well, well, it depends. Are you satisfied with the answers? Would you like to discuss more about them, Mikko? Uh, I think that uh, they are good answers, <laughs> and it's just interesting if uh, that. Um, how this uh, large XML content or XML schema is it possible to, to how how easy it is to to define the interface? Yeah, <coughs> uh, unless if somebody didn't see or uh, if Daniel, uh, you didn't, I think we didn't forward the questions yet, <coughs> but to briefly repeat the Mikos questions, good ones. Uh, uh, where, uh, okay, now I don't have, <laughs> have them here. I have email client closed right now, but uh, <coughs> for, for having a large either model or XML content is something that uh, builds up kind of based on what you are modeling. And uh, we can, I think we better uh, focus on those kind of 
in more detail when I start to show you how we can start modularizing things. So basically, usually the model doesn't grow that large because you effectively can split the information models to be independent entities. And it's kind of, uh, kind of like because you can easily and clearly join them together, you can keep them very pure and very small, which makes the reusability even more more uh, kind of easy to notify. So that's for the model, model size issue. Then the XML content itself uh, represents other issues. I mean, uh, all solvable, but I, I can see a way where you could enter up with huge content, especially if you would be building a large system with multiple modules uh, cross-connected, I mean, like cross-connected smaller systems. But we can dive to those in practice a bit later today okay. when I start to finish those, those parts, so we can actually nail them in the concrete fashion. Yes. But the second question was the reusability, but that question was uh, from Markku Tukiainen, Professor Markku Tukiainen, mm. and he just asked that question. Yeah, that I, I try to demonstrate it today. Uh, I unfortunately I'll I'll give you a kind of overview and explain it uh, how it's actually done, but I don't have proper demonstration to kind of show it <coughs> in the Git Git system. We use a Git-based version controlling system that that uh, has a feature for submodules, and those submodules kind of implicitly allow us to modularize the whole thing. And uh, the modules will be completely reusable uh, within kind of... It's something that would be considered kind of software libraries if you think of that you can have a software library that's uh, above the platform level. So you have a library that targets any number of technical platforms. And... Uh, through that you get kind of logical level reusability, which is, when done properly, it's immensely more powerful and simpler than uh, object level language kind of reusability. Yes. But I try, to, I try to give the overview and good examples on that, and we can definitely continue the dialogue even after the workshop with the very concrete demonstrations of how you can achieve it. Yes. Then, Kalle, yesterday there was also a question from Alessandro regarding inheritance, and, uh, and then the, another question is coming, but there was a question about uh, uh, how to represent inheritance, and you were already answering the question, and I think also how to return more complex objects instead of uh, simple types like uh, strings or booleans or whatever. Uh, I don't know whether they were satisfied because you were already answering the question yesterday. And then we have. Yeah, I think uh, that's worth worth also discussing more, uh, because in some cases you might have, for instance, existing deep uh, inheritance hierarchies that you need to support, or and or you might want to or have to support kind of multiple inheritance, and you can model both of those. Uh, either partially or fully with ADM, you can basically make a C language, for instance, a completely <coughs> object-oriented, if you will, <coughs> through the uh, generators and, uh, well, the stuff that you would do manually to achieve different interfaces to the same object. But uh, we, can, we can dive into that also deeper if we start to get proper or better examples. If we can get a concrete example, we can start to approach it. Uh, they are also, I don't know if you spotted the question, there is another question from them. Uh, they are asking whether there are already existing software houses using this technology, ADM and the ball. Yeah, uh, very few. It's a... It's a the ball concept is pretty new, and uh, well, ADM has been matured during the last two years, but 
kind of unfortunately we failed to find a party who understands that it's immediately usable. We tried to promote it in Microsoft seminars, uh, got some attention, some odd people interested and, and used it at some scope, but not at the level where it should be or it could be used in a wider scope of software production. We use it in-house, we used it on the taxation agency project, but until until very recently be uh, coming up with the ball model and uh, realizing the actual platform so that we kind of have existing library of automations available. Before that, it was really difficult to communicate to people that it's ready to use and it, it uh, yields immensely power, immense amount of power when you need to cross-platform support things, for instance, on mobile development field. Because when the libraries are empty, you kind of need to invest the time to understand that you can start self-automating your your job. So the number is uh, really small compared to, well, what I'd, I would say uh, a simplicity to use when you start to use it. So you are kind of uh, one of the first guinea pigs. But uh, Pekka was so convinced when we met that uh, he enforced you to this position and apparently managed to sell the idea for Mikko, if I understand properly. So, are there uh, other questions before we start for today? Other questions from Cagliari, from Mikko? No, at the moment. Not, not at the moment. So we can start, Kalle. Okay. <clears throat> I'll start sharing again the full screen. And let's hope that I stay on that. So does everybody see my screen? We are seeing your screen, your screen request. And yes, we are beginning to see your screen with a flexible agenda. Yeah, I kind of made again, <laughs> I'll, I'll share with you this content later on. Uh, I kind of tried to make the uh, brief agenda of what, what, what I try to achieve here. Uh, yesterday I demonstrated very briefly on some, some ADM used in a kind of local fashion. So it was kind of very bound to this uh, say exact software project. The generators and all the material was as the source code artifact with, uh, with basically zero uh, modularity or reusability aspect uh, in that form uh, if you count out the manual copy paste and managing of things through that. So today I, I uh, expand the view in uh, several ADM modules. Then I uh, explain how we, as fluently as code artifacts, can generate documentation out of the uh, abstraction models as well. And then, uh, then some <laughs> I'm explaining something, but apparently I moved on from that line. Sorry for that. Uh, I'll demonstrate something that's also Git downloadable. I can paste this to the chat. Yes, thank you. And there is, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that requires some of tweaking if you start to modify it, but it works on the, uh, as is, as downloaded here without uh, running the templates. Oh, uh, okay. Confusing, confusing. It works as is. If you run into problems, you can drop me a line if you start to modify it. I'll show in the demo the logical operation structure. It's kind of a process or workflow kind of approach, but in this case there is no engine nor even a library requirement. We simply generate the orchestration code that makes our uh, code more structured in an operation fashion. And then I use that as an example for explaining the information flow between the modules. Then I try to explain the cross-platform migration, how you can achieve from even migrating from your existing legacy system in the need when you need to develop something, um, some new features on new platform, or if you are doing mobile development and you need to 
start supporting completely new devices, how you can start to gradually move your implementation to a higher level of abstraction and then realize both or all the platforms in parallel. Then I uh, explain more about this ecosystem and library usage, kind of complete library reusability. It's basically fully functional technically in Git already. It requires certain usage of Git. It's not, not entirely polished, but the idea and the concept is already working. So I try to explain it to you in the Git terms. And uh, I do, because uh, my Visio license expired in a bad, bad moment of time, and we are in, in, in between of renewing our Microsoft comp uh, competency uh, partnership, I'll, uh, I'll use actually some part from our actual blog site to explain some of the things so you know where the material is, even though it's a bit sparse in the blog, or actually quite sparse, but... Uh, and then if, <clears throat> if we have enough time, uh, I try to explain also, or, or I have enough time to explain the ball as a brief, brief version. I suggest that uh, you go and uh, later on, if you haven't checked out the videos, you check the videos from the ball, because I've held the presentation a few times, and it never goes as smooth as those when I manage to do the videos. So it's best explained through those ones. But I, I do explain some of the concrete aspects that we already implemented and are further implementing in the platform, because it's uh, something very concrete that you can start. Uh, well, you can start playing it with it on Visual Studio area, basically already. But we are very soon starting to polish it. When I uh, I start to talk with Pekka, how he wants to, what kind of approaches he he sees, and with uh, with your people what kind of approaches your people see and want to take on, uh, on possibly building, building with us on this or uh, taking the other areas. Okay, <clears throat> so let's, let's dive the, uh, <clears throat> to the operation module. I'll open something here, let's see. <clears throat> Did the uh, screen already refresh to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, you can see Visual Studio. Okay. <clears throat> so in this example, we have actually a logical operation structure. I'll, uh, I'll show you it in the XML first, what we have here. Then I remind you what we have in the uh, folder structure and explain how the information flows in between of those things. So this what you see now is again the visual XML schema editor. We have here a uh, logical operation abstraction, which means that we have uh, multiple sets of operations. Each of you can consider like a method well documented and uh, a method that does series of things. So. <coughs> Operation has a name, then in this model it also has a, is this text, by the way, large enough to be visible? It is on screen, but not on projector. Okay. Better uh, now. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay. This is, this is just a problem of our projector, don't worry. On the screen it can be seen very, very good. Okay, uh, well, I'll show you the other steps on the XML, so if you barely can see this, I'll walk relatively th uh, straight through on this. Uh, we have uh, designed in the operation, so the specification need to be given, and there are use case level specifications, requirements can be given on a technical basis as well, such as performance requirements, memory constraints, CPU time constraints, and the description. Uh, as a freeform text, for instance. Then there is separate information model for what we call operation signature. And this is, if, if you recall from yesterday, when you have a service, uh, service kind of interface contract, you always have the exact parameter data types and the exact name of the method and the service. And 
Based on those exact namings, we can start calculating signatures. And why these are relevant is that using these signatures, we can use a library that has uh, thousands or millions of operations that can still be cross-connected by a graph algorithms uh, and uh, graph databases when they simply see a uh, calling operation, or what kind of signature it tries to call, and then it matches the another operation from the library that uh, fulfills the signature. I, I try to explain this more visually a bit later on, but this is what we use in the model to have various signatures in the operation. Then we have uh, parameters, so it's basically, now I'm taking a long way to say that we actually have a method level definition of an operation from what's seen as an outsider. So you have an operation with a name and with the parameters that all have a name, data type, and then some kind of design level description for documentation and readiness state uh, for each of the elements in the operation. Then uh, <coughs> what, what makes this kind of workflow approach is that execution block, in this case, is a sequential execution. So it can have a custom code execution as a platform level method execute calls. It can have an operation execute calls that calls simply another operation. And this is kind of a, where we can stay on the higher level of abstraction when we call an operation from another operation. And because we don't use actually any libraries or frameworks, it's as uh, efficient uh, from the compiler's perspective than the manual code. But we still have a kind of better declaration of what we are going to call. And then we can have return values from the operation, which are kind of, which is a way to define that if you want to return a primitive data type, that's fine. But if you in some case want to return a collection or combination of uh, <coughs> information, you can also already define it in the operational level. So you don't have to fabricate a data type uh, elsewhere to be able to deploy uh, or return certain kind of data. So this is the model, model uh, roughly explained of what we have as an operation. I'll dive now to the Visual Studio side. Did the screen refresh OK? Uh, yes, we can see Visual Studio. OK. Did it take how long from when I... Does it take seconds to refresh? Uh, I was looking at the chat list, uh, so I will ask people here. No. No issues. Very, very fast. OK. OK. Well, then I'll keep the pace as it is right now. So uh, we have uh, here again in the abstractions, I've categorized the uh, modules here. In the base, we have something that's a common for running the abstractions. There is a separate console mode uh, executable that runs on the, currently on the .NET environment, also uh, on the mono, mono for open source and cross-platform platform version. It's kind of... Uh, make file, uh, or make, in kind of that. It executes the uh, uh, abstractions in a proper order and transformations between them. Then there are some common include structures and uh, configuration structures. You don't usually have to touch those things at all, but they just come with the package. Of, uh, and each of these things comes in a, in a separate Git module. Actually, I can show it from, I realized that how it's, best visible. Mm -hmm. Okay, works. So I go to our main repository. If you look at here on the right side, you see all kinds of uh, dedicated repositories for each serving a single abstraction. It means that all the modules you see 
on the Visual Studio come from separate GitHub or Git repository. And it's basically, it can be done in a, this kind of fashion when we rely on the information models being in sync with each other or uh, with a specific version. And those models very rarely change. So we can, for instance, introduce a new code generation or new transformation on an existing module, and it's uh, backwards compatible still. So every application can simply pick up the newest version of the module and then suddenly start supporting a new platform when just somebody uh, added a Git generator for that, for that very module. So <clears throat> each of these are separate Git uh, repositories same thing with the transformations. These are new things. You yesterday saw only abstractions. The transformations are, are something that transform information between two abstractions in the project. So <clears throat> when we start with the operation input, we actually run, run it uh, through the operation abstraction to get code out of it. Then we run from operation to documentation transformation, uh, then from operation to status tracking transformation, and status tracking to documentation transformation to kind of let the information, information from the operation structure to flow on to the documentation uh, uh, generators. And I'll, I'll try to demonstrate this and then explain it uh, in very... Uh, file system level to explain <laughs> how it flows the, the parts. And then in the final form, we get two documentations and again, some kind of code generated out of it. So we get full, uh, fully working, all those small so solution uh, with, it, with full documentation in it. Uh, I'll dive to the word for a moment because it's the best way to show what we have uh, what we have in the logical operation here so this is uh, this is content for all of the operations right now in the uh, in the solution and for this demonstration I've been I've had very little time during the last two years to prepare these kinds of demonstrations when we build on and on this method so it's a very very thin demonstration, but logically one operation kind of explains it already. So <clears throat> we have an operation with the name of sort numbers, evens before odds, uh, that takes as input parameters a data array and an ascending order uh, parameters. The parameters are more documented here. Uh, the color is blue here because they, these, these parts that are blue require still attention. I'll explain them a bit more when we get to the status tracking part. Then we have also hard-coded, uh, sorry, um, uh, performance constraint requirement, uh, type of maximum time allowed. Uh, that's defining the, the operation that it needs to complete uh, in, in runtime environment within this uh, given criteria. Then we have some validation rules, then execution, sequence, sequential execution for sort numbers first, and then sort evers before odds. And this is using a order preserving algorithm, so it's a kind of, even if, if it's a stupid operation, it, it actually works in a, in a demonstration for this kind of thing. And its specification says here that it should retain the current order because it requires that to be functional. And then it returns something uh, of a custom data type. Uh, sorry, doesn't actually. Uh, it custom data type, but it's consi consisting only an in integer array here. So this is what a normal specification maker or a use case use case revisitor could see. It's a one example. We've done a different kind of documents on the live project, depending on what kind of documents they wanted to see. This is kind of neutral one. So I'll show you now where, where it fetches the input data from.
Is this readable from your projector now? Yes, it is. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, same kind of structure that you had, uh, that we had yesterday for uh, service. Of course, a completely different terminology. So, if we uh, would have uh, another operation here, we simply follow again the uh, schema specification for making the changes and kind of follow follow what's required. If, if I leave something out here, the schema starts to complain that uh, this is incomplete uh, as a content. So it's uh, out of the box XML support for entering the data in a proper fashion. Uh, this is not complete kind of if, if you have experience on domain-specific languages, the XML falls short on various aspects, but it's very practical, and it's practical enough for most use cases. So it's a kind of something that you don't have to start building a tooling outside of it to, to stay productive and to be able to communicate to the other party what your model is saying. So here we basically have, uh, have all the content that our operation in uh, code-wise is containing. I'll actually remove that requirement for a bit, commenting it out. We have a description for the uh, specification that's you, that you saw in the word. Then we have the parameters defined here, uh, a validation, and then the execution blocks of method execute in this case. This is, there is no cross-operational calls right now. Then uh, what I tried to yesterday pull off on the fly as a something that, uh, that would track, for instance, status information in addition of our progress uh, of the actual code. In here, in this uh, model, we have so-called state attribute in the model, which says that it's items readiness status and any real change uh, uh, in the underlying design. So this is kind of a manually updatable field. We don't try to uh, try to. Sorry, I had to kill a bug in a wall. Lost <laughs> the sentence there. So we don't try to over automate or over intelligent make the process any any intelligent. Uh, where it couldn't be, so instead the actual software designer or developer is supposed to enter these fields here. They are kind of exactly where they should be in kind of way that uh, if this uh, operation is first at implemented state completely. Let's see if, if I make all the levels implemented here, let's pretend that we have something finally complete. And then I run the transformations through running the abstraction builder here. It actually runs these in order that it, uh, it runs the transformations from this operations, the document, status tracking, and uh, all the others, and then the generators of the code generator and the word generator. If I manage to spot every part there, this document should be empty. No, it's not. There is still one that I missed. I'll try to tag that one as well. Sorry for this jumping. I just want to show you how it works also when, when you have a real-world project that's, uh, that's being developed further, so you don't have to start from scratch. Let me run, run this first again. So running it again, now I should have an empty document. Yes, this is an example of how we can track our status from real coder's perspective of things. So we have a separate status tracking 
artifact that, uh, that's, that's being crafted to a document form. And we also have in the operations document something that starts to color things. So if we communicate to specification level people in an active project, they can immediately see if something needs to be revisited. And this is what we actually did in the taxation agency project. It was kind of huge, huge success to those people who really uh, were, uh, for a reason, very, very specific and tied that the specification is exactly as it should be so that the code can follow it. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. I don't think uh, is on the phone with me and uh, he would like to, to say hello to everybody. I don't know if you can actually hear hear him on the phone. Pekka, say hello. But, uh, hello guys, uh, can you hear me or should I, uh, uh, Daniel, are you telling me what I say or can everybody hear me now? So are you hearing Pekka? Yes. Yes. You, are you hearing me? Yeah, 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 they are able to hear you, Pekka. Alright guys, so uh, uh, this is Pekka, I'm also calling into the workshop. I had to tell you how, how I am because I'm working on because I'm working on the uh, uh, the post uh, geology and I, uh, I'm calling in to the meeting from Paris where I have introduced uh, the, the, the topic of the workshop to about 15 people here. And a lot of people around Europe are very excited about hearing uh, what you guys have learned. So I just wanted to call in to say uh, uh, keep up the good work and I'll be you know, very uh, uh, exciting looking for the results. Alright? So, okay. We understand. Excellent. And uh, Carl, uh, I'm so happy that you're running the workshop and I wish you the best of luck and uh, uh, happy days. I continue my life in Paris. <laughs> Good luck. And, uh, well, just wait to hear the real results from your own people. <laughs> then you know how much, uh, how well I did. Call you quickly. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye, Pekka. Bye, bye. Bye. Okay, sorry for the interruption, but Pekka was calling me on the mobile phone. And... No, and he apparently had a reason to call during the workshop. So Probably, it's, it's yes. Okay. And, uh, we heard he's in Paris and he's talking about this, uh, idea, this whole thing to people in Paris. I don't even know what he's, is he doing in Paris, but I guess <laughs> this is <kind> of <laughs> Okay, sorry for the interruption. No problem. I try to keep this. Uh, it's a bit difficult to have a, even on a live. I, I mean, Pekka's phone call didn't probably interrupt much on this, but I try to get a, get into the point with this uh, as well. So basically, uh, nailing to what we experienced on the real world, we did this kind of approach in the taxation agency project. It was one of the first abstractions we ever ever kind of made in practice and uh, it came kind of huge success out of real world status tracking so when we had some change let's say that this sort, sort numbers method execute would need to be revisited kind of important uh, revisit the specs kind of way in a real world, world process, somebody modifies the requirement and we push it back to the state of under design, so it's not even design approved. Then we run again. This is sometimes asked if we would we want to run this automatically in the background. Uh, that's doable or during the build process, but uh, usually I've done it on a manual fashion because it's, uh, it's, it's faster. I mean, I mean, you don't need to have a back-end support for the automation. You can run it on the, on the workstation as well, especially when you do the modeling changes. You really want to run it uh, locally, fully, before you start checking in your uh, uh, model-wide changes. So I, I went, went and put a one, one feature method execution to, uh, under design. What it means that now suddenly our status tracking document is showing that we are, uh, we are not, not anymore 
with a complete scope of this, uh, this operation. It's underlining that uh, one part is under design, which means that other people than the developers should give their uh, input to the process and explain or revisit these specs, for instance. Same thing if they read it from uh, actual operation content. So we can also hear it's uh, just a standard word documentation that, uh, that colors the thing here. And it's just uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that we can combine the information coming from the developers to be completely exact for, for the other perspectives of the process as well. Let me put it back to implemented in this stage. And run these ones again. I'll, I'll now show you the code of what this actually does, so you start to hopefully understand more of how it's linked in the real world. So I have an example program that's using this very operation. It's again pretty much as, as intelligent as the other one, just a constant prototype of, of demonstration. But basically, we can have any line of code. You can imagine that this could be, uh, well, we have a different demonstration for, for instance, in an Android version, where you have a mobile client code. You have your normal manual code here, normal manually written code, that simply has this uh, additional class of sort numbers, events before odds, that has a method execute. So you can kind of uh, treat the outcome from the ADM automation module as something that is in parallel of your own manual code. So you don't have to kind of control the whole program with ADM to be able to start using it. And the moment you start having these calls, you kind of give the control to the automated architectural level. So. In this, in this context, we have two execute, execute demonstrations. First one is running uh, from uh, 1 to 10, sorting array, events before odds. And then we have another one that's running on a 5 million entries, the same, uh, same process. And then it's printing the first 10 ones out of it. I'll run the whole program now. So first one's come relatively fast. The other one that's uh, 5 million zeros, ordered and 10 first, takes a bit longer. Now from the manual code side, this is kind of where you start using, you could be using any kind of reusable library here. The experience is basically the same. You make a call for the other code in a fashion that's, uh, that it requires you to call it. Now let's go back to the operation content and make that one modification and introduce that requirement that was there originally. So I have a support for requirement structure where I can have uh, requirements of different categories. For instance, customer level, architectural level, structural, functional, non-functional, all kinds of things. These, uh, these came come from the model as is. I actually haven't implemented any of the other code, code changing ones than the uh, performance requirement. I'll show what, what the model says for those. It actually offers different kinds of metrics here for the operation to, to be uh, kind of constrained with. But right now the demonstration is actually quite lazy done, so it's only supporting the max total mi time milliseconds, because the other ones were a bit difficult to, or too difficult for me to fast demonstrate. But what I just did is that I declared in the operational level that from the start to begin, uh, beginning to end, this operation is required to uh, perform a maximum of uh, 1,000 milliseconds. 
And then I run the generators again. I look at the uh, documentation. It again says that there is a requirement for this very thing, so it's completely in sync. Then I run the debug debugging of this program again. Now we get first uh, the fast one. And then we actually get an exception. And this is, I'll show you how stupid code is on the background, but uh, the idea is, is uh, still very valid. So I'll close the exception now and show you better how it ends up here. This is the part of the code that automation is generating for that information. Let, let me try to... Big, bigger view. It's basically the static method, the execute that you, that I showed you in the in the program call. That actually this uh, very silly uh, test program is using. It calls the execute for two versions, or actually two versions of execute with different data array input. Because of the requirement, the generator is injecting here enough. Line, a few lines of code. First, it takes the starting time, and then at the end, it measures if the starting time, uh, from that, we spend too much time and throws the exception. In between, it runs only very simply orchestrated order of things, so it prepares the parameters, runs the validations in order if we had those kinds of things defined, and then it runs the two execution steps in a very kind of straightforward fashion. So it simply looks for the XML schema, uh, sorry, XML document, uh, uh, or, uh, or actually the object model that serialized from the XML document uh, uh, in order to make these calls. Kalle, that's sorry. really, that's really fascinating. I mean, non-technical people or, uh, let's say, people directly talking to the customer, the customer would, uh, uh, would just uh, uh, have the concern to limit the, the execution time to uh, one second. And then non-technical people could just add these uh, three, li three XML lines of code just to throw the exception if the time limit is reached. Yeah, yes, yes, this is exactly what we, uh, we, we uh, tried to demonstrate here, our yeah. approach. That's, that's fascinating. Is there also a way to react to, to these exceptions by using automations, or, or technical people or, the, or developers should uh, come in and uh, modify the code to react to these, uh, to catch the exception and then eventually react uh, if it is Yeah, uh, yeah I'll try to show you. Uh, from the generator side where it actually does the... So I jump now on the abstraction level, uh, on the template generator level of that thing. Let's see where it's... Uh, that's... So here is the part uh, that's generating the block for performance requirement assert. So basically, it's just a stupid code here. Whatever you want to do here, for instance, do diagnostic logging instead. So in case you are running a debugging or demo a test version or test environment, you might not want your program completely explode if it breaks the requirements, but you want to rather have a diagnostic logging, for instance, for certain limit of breakage. I mean, if it, if it reaches, for instance, 80% uh, uh, of level, you do a LIDAR option 
lighter uh, reaction than for for breaking uh, uh, the the time limit entirely. So making this change again, of course, if I run the generators again, reflect immediately the, the code, the, the orchestration code in the designer side. Sorry, actually, did I run in the demo effect? No, I, I had to build it. Oh, sorry. It's a modular abstraction. I modified the, this part, but I didn't rebuild the solution, so it was using the old version. Let's try again. It should be now there. Yes. So the uh, kind of the idea even though this is a brute example, uh, and it actually does infect your uh, uh, execution, so it, it doesn't do it in a, in a kind of uh, intelligent or uh, uh, hidden fashion. If you think that you want to run a performance monitoring in addition to your run, live running application, it doesn't matter how you inject the monitors there, they will affect your uh, running application anyway. And in this case, if we, in a logical architectural fashion, constrain the fact that uh, we take the timestamp ourselves on the very beginning before the operation does anything else, and we measure it in the very end, it doesn't affect the, uh, other than, of course, uh, upper, upper stack calling operations, it doesn't affect much of the actual performance, even the monitoring. So it's just a, just a demonstration that you can, for instance, using ADM, you can fully customize the way you want to track, for instance, real-time performance requirements on any embedded Linux platform, because you don't need any kind of libraries for that. Uh, okay. Uh, using the time constraints uh, for this workshop, uh, I would jump on, staying on the higher overview here. Uh, I'll be very happy to assist you when you get hands on these things on Visual Studio, because it takes a bit more time to get accustomed to those things. And I'll, I'll link you with the videos where you can get really uh, from ground up using the abstractions and building them if that's okay for you. Sure, sure, Kalle. Sure. Okay, uh, I try to pick few visualizations of what's happening here in case, or did it make any sense to you when I tried to explain? Let me, let me try to show it in the, uh, in the actual file system where the information goes. Let's put a hidden folders visible. So we have here a uh, one project that's containing the abstraction content. And this is actually different, one of the key differences from what you saw yesterday. Yesterday we had the XML content of the abstraction side by side with the generators, which basically ruins all the reusability, unless you really want to share that very exact version, which is basically the same that you would be sharing series of, uh, uh, well, basically series of source code or uh, library. In here, it's a bit, bit changed from that, so that we have the actual operation abstraction here that's generating the code. We have the documentation abstraction here that's generating the documentation, but, but the uh, input and output they play with is separ separated from those modules. And uh, it's done in a quite of very, very stupid and simple fashion. It simply looks down few folders from this level, and then goes back up few folders to find its own name in the, in the content structure. It could have more intelligence, but right now it's very straightforward. So if we start off where the process starts, we have uh, operation content. This is the actual file that, uh, that we were editing. It's actually say, saying that this document is opened by another project. So this is the uh, starting point of, of where we use, where we start this uh, full information flow onwards. 
Then from operation abstraction perspective, the outcome is actually the source code. So uh, this abstraction is reading the XML and generating the source code, which again is actually used in the building project, but physically the file is located under this folder structure. So this is the same file that you saw a while ago when I tried to show the orchestration structure. Then the uh, transformations that I introduced in the beginning, they take the operation structure from operation to documentation and from operation to status tracking. Uh, just a second, I'll close the door. Well, it sounds like already, uh, I'm still monitoring the chat, so if somebody from uh, Agile Group or, or, or Mikko has got any question, I'm still monitoring the chat list. Okay, I'm back. Uh, uh, okay, I'll continue. Uh, apparently, no interruptions. Uh, so the transformations take, they are simply named to be intuitive, but they take from operation to documentation, which means that in the documentation input, we have uh, documentation from operation content. And then apparently we also has, have uh, documentation from status content. This might be actually old one. This might be a ghost. But then we have a documentation from status tracking from operation content, which basically is end result of having a, a operation to status tracking, which takes again input from operation and output as a status tracking thing. I'll show you briefly how we get how we get the documentations in that fashion. So this is the starting point. From the status tracking perspective, we actually have something like this. We have completely different schema that's, uh, that's using status items uh, and traffic light indicators of green, yellow, and red. So it's a uh, it's completely different information model that's being simply transformed from the operation information. And there is a... Uh, basically complete, completely custom code doing that transformation, but it's very straightforward. So I'll show you what status tracking is uh, from the schema perspective. It's again same kind of abstraction. In this case, though, we don't have any generators, but again, we have the symmetrical model for this. So if I open the schema, we have something like this. We have uh, status items, which have uh, attributes such as uh, name and display name, and then a status value that's uh, traffic-like indicator, indicator display text and indicator value. And these, some of these have a constraint for what values they can have. So traffic-like indicator can be of red, yellow or green. And this is, uh, this is kind of starting to answer part of the Mikko's question that uh, we don't have to have, compared to some traditional approaches of having one uh, monolithic large model to describe our whole process, in the ADM we can do it in a more pure way that we focus only on areas that very specifically say the things that that very area wants to express, and then we implement the transformations between the, these two kind of information fields or information uh, models. So the status items doesn't care at all that operations is going to feed it. It could be a manually integrated. Actually, we have an integration from a status item level to team foundation server product that's making a project status tracking. So. It's uh, this. This is what starts to bite in a way that you can integrate to something that's really uh, 
speaks the language that you are integrating into and then on the background uh, handle the transformations between different models. Then here, okay, I won't deep in the st status items for more right now, but that's the part how we get from operations to status items. Then we, uh, to get to the documentation side, again we have a documentation abstraction that has uh, generators, but also of course the model. And in the documentation model we have relatively straightforward schema. We can have uh, multiple documentations, multiple documents in the model, but of course we can also have multiple models where, uh, I mean multiple XMLs where each XML represents one model and one document within that model. And as an end result we again get multiple documents out. So what we have when we look at the document abstraction is again some kind of name for the document, some kind of a title for it, then styles is probably, I think it's, uh, well that's, I don't recall that it's properly implemented. Oh yeah, you can have named styles and that's about it for, for the document. And then in the content wise, you can have headers which kind of then lead to other content. So you have header that has a, that's kind of a title text or subheader text and then you can have a level in the header that's actually a hierarchy. Uh, within the header you can have either paragraphs that can contain a text or a table in this case and texts then and eventually we start to get to something real content. So in text, you can have text content or another header within the other header, so you start to get the subheaders. And with this kind of abstraction, we then can produce with one generator both the documents. So we only need one documentation abstraction, and we can then drive status tracking to documentation and operations to documentation uh, through one series of generators. And if you start to think of uh, cross-platform features from the documentation side, now we have a Word document generator here that outputs a doc file, but simply adding a PDF generator here or some other generator would immediately allow us to have all our documents in the new formats. We could have a remote document server somewhere or an integration from it. Okay, now now I'm kind of starting to miss, mix uh, unmixable things. But basically you can consider uh, any kind of output then being reusable simply by using the same, a bit higher than just word level uh, abstraction for documentation. Kalle, sorry to interrupt. There is a a question from uh, from Alessandro. Uh, there was in, a, in, a, in an XML file, a file ten minutes ago. There was a data type equal int uh, and then uh, square bracket. So uh, who, wrote, who wrote the code was aware of which language he was going to use. For example, Java. Alessandro says, and then the XML cannot give chance to have 100% porting to completely different languages, which is the goal of ADM. So I don't really remember where this uh, was, but uh, I, because I did not see it. So there was a, a point in an XML file which, in which there was data type equal integer, uh, integer array. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Uh, in this, this example, the XML is actually platform bound up to some, some level. So uh, <clears throat> if you want to do cross-platform, you, you need to either get rid of those parts and have a logical data type such as uh, integer that you then uh, in the generator you map it in the different, uh, different language specific data type. Or then you can have uh, other, other ways that you have uh, in the XML you have different elements for different languages. So in the XML level you recognize that you want to output to uh, 
Java, and then you use some other ex, uh, uh, expression for the same thing. So it's kind of a, you can choose which which kind of a trade-off you want to take uh, when you do the cross-platform development. Okay, so even if you are writing XML, you still have to choose uh, or to think uh, about which programming language you would like to output the code. And then at, at a certain point you are bounded to uh, this particular language, uh, am I right? Um, well, it's a, it's a kind of your choice of making. If you make your generator to read the XML straightforward to the code, then probably in your model and with that generator until you uh, kind of improve it, you are more or less platform bound. But later on, it's a, you can always revisit your model and your generator, change some terminology overall to your XML, simply replacing the integers, for instance. Or uh, how I've done with the cross-platform mobile thing, I use the C-sharp data types for primitives in the XML, but my generator, when it reads the data type, it reads it as a, it kind of, see, if it sees a string, in a certain way written in C-sharp, it outputs it in a different way to Java or C++, for instance. So you are not bound in any more than your generator is requiring you to be. There is a flexibility and freedom to, uh, to inter kind of interfere the process and still output it as a language-specific when you generate language-specific stuff from it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see that uh, Agile Group is, uh, is writing uh, something more. I don't know if there, are, if there are other questions from them. No, there aren't, so we can continue. Thank you, Kalle, for, for the answer. Okay. Uh, I try to now start to visualize the, uh, these, how we can start sharing these kinds of things. And then we can come back with the actual questions and fill in the blanks where I jumped too far. Let's see. Uh, now I tried to uh, explain to you example of how we can have a logical process flow uh, and uh, an operation defined and giving you a fast run on the information flows between the different abstractions. Uh, I have uh, my colleague, or partner in crime, Jurun Karels, just happened to make today a visualization of ball code sharing. I think this probably helps to understand the migration path. So I'll, I'll share this with you. Uh, we have concrete cases right now, or, or very promising prospects. Uh, we are mostly working with Microsoft because of our background, but uh, sometimes it applies also cross-platform. But basically, migrating from existing legacy applications to either from Oracle database uh, to SQL Server database uh, or from any other database to theirs, uh, or uh, migrating legacy <laughs> client-server applications gradually to use the cloud platforms. And of course, when we do this in an ADM fashion, it doesn't even bind, them, bind the end solution to Microsoft platforms. But in this case, we use it as kind of a concrete example. So, uh, if you have an existing solution code base, let's say you have a Ruby on Rails. Uh, I think this is Python. Uh, you don't use some logos. I have no clue which this, this is, is. Python. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Python. And this, I think, is a Windows. Basically, you can gradually start migrating your existing code base by simply replacing the structures uh, bit by bit with ADM structures. You don't have to overwork. You don't have to throw the full application at a, at a time. But basically, when you, ha when you have to do for some other reason uh, throughout refactoring, let's say you upgrade some library that's not completely compatible with the older one or some other reason, or you really introduce a completely new platform, and then you do it, that one with ADM, you can then port back the older ones. But basically, you have your original code base, you start 
migrating some parts. In this example, you have a login, login logic for a web application or a client server application. You make it kind of ADM module level thing. You don't have to overwork it. It can be first as Tyler at that application, but the, the moment you start to have uh, it, it described in the XML fashion, you can start to reuse it when you realize where your project specific things start to disappear. And then when you have it once done, you can then have uh, take advantage of the generators that you can self-made or reuse from uh, from wherever the community is making them, and suddenly you start to have support for all the platforms that are available for those modules, even if you had no clue how to write, for instance, Objective-C for uh, uh, iPhone or Android stuff, or then uh, the Windows phone, phone stuff for, the, for that platform. So this is kind of a visualization of how you can start moving existing stuff gradually. To, to what we call the ball, then to be shared. Um, okay, now I try to give, okay, this, I try to show you the ecosystem and library usage to a visualization. Let's see if it's, uh, if I prepared you enough for this. Is there a question? Uh, a question has just came up. Uh, let me check it. Ah, comment. Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Ah, okay, no, no question. Well, no, not for the moment. If you want to, to read uh, Alessandro com Alessandro's comment, so maybe. Well, I can. Let me check. Yeah, this is something, yes, if I understand properly, it depends, basically it depends how high you define the things. Sometimes you can take very much advantage of existing code structures, and then sometimes uh, you simply don't need them. But the power of the generators is that you can refactor uh, pretty freely all the code that your generators provide, as long as the kind of interface to manual code stays the same. Which basically means that, um, in very concrete practice, it means that you can use pretty crappy code on the fly when you are developing something, because you know that you can come and revisit those structures any time later on. So that's why, for instance, we are focusing. What you see, if you ever look at the ball code base right now, it's, uh, <laughs> well, I'll show you one file which says more than a thousand words. Let me see where are my designer file is. I don't properly recall where it is, but it's, uh, it's easy to spot from the size of it. Okay, I'll have to... It's from here, if I recall. Yeah, this is, this is one file that's two megabytes of source code right now. It's a huge file. It's like something like 80,000 lines, I suppose. It's starting to be too big for the Visual Studio to handle properly, so I have to split it. At some, some stage, I have to introduce some sanity in the model. But right now, I kind of pull in each class is generating their support structures, which could be librarized. And I will definitely <laughs> librarize them in the later on. But basically, whatever you, uh, you push for the responsibility of the generator, you can keep it there. And you can refactor and polish your solution to be more platform specific or less platform specific later on. So insta for instance, for we take advantage of the latest .NET on some areas, uh, even uh, performance wise, 
taking performance wise penalties on that areas because we know kind of that we can later on port them on the native C++ or C and completely ditch the uh, .NET runtime from the process. But that's something uh, for uh, for when you do the Java generation. It depends what kind of hooks you generate for the manual code to use. Okay. I hope that kind of answers the question. Okay. Uh, I'll try to explain now the ecosystem picture. It's, uh, it's one, si one page in the blog. It's a bit, bit uh, difficult to digest before you know, and if, I'm not sure if it's, if it's easy to open even later on, but I, I've sometimes managed to explain it through this. Uh, what you've seen now is kind of, uh, this is where you have your average or normal developer working in this, uh, and, and especially mainstream developer. I'm not now not comparing this uh, to existing domain-specific uh, modeling tools uh, usage, because then there we start to have the similarities of uh, automation. But this is compared from the kind of, average software project with the average mainstream developers. They produce program code and some kind of documentation and manuals, or not, but at least some program code. This is where you see your normal mobile development per platform to happen, or uh, things like that. Then, uh, uh, introducing the abstractions here, it kind of introduces the generators that target part of the program code and part of all, all of the manuals and documentation. This is where you introduce roles such as a software designer. This is the guy where that we define that's filling uh, the XML content. He is not the guy that's defining the XML schema or defining the architecture, but simply using the existing abstractions. So he knows how he can enter a new operation, but his role is not to modify the operation structure or introduce new features to that. So it's kind of a design level input. And specification requirements can play on this field as well. Uh, I'll see if I can demonstrate to you a non-XML uh, view, I mean, better view to the same XML content through the uh, form, form technology to do the same thing. But we've, we've uh, actually guinea picked some, well, okay, they were kind of technical people, but non-coders that lived pretty, pretty well with the operation structure as it is. So this is kind of where you start using abstractions that you can use within a singular, single project. And then we've identified the software architect role that are, that's responsible for uh, modifying the models and modifying the generators to comply with the reference architecture. So this is the guy that can make the uh, make new abstractions and modify the existing ones. And then uh, he's also in responsible of uh, maintaining the transformations between them and defining them because he is handling the models. So this is kind of uh, what you see at the project scope level. Then we kind of have figured out a way to introduce ecosystem library kind of thing. Uh, we can have uh, additional metadata where every uh, module that can be bound uh, to that very module or very specific version on the, on the uh, version control. Uh, if you are familiar with Git, I'll show you some, some parts of Git here. Use this one as an example. This is actually our ball repository. In Git and also it should apply on every distributed version controlling system. You have a um, so-called commit hashtag that identifies your commit. It's a, uh, it includes complete a version history of that repository. It means that if you validate that value through external uh, 
authority or wherever trust authority, you can be sure that it, the repository contains exactly what the uh, validation part is saw it to contain. So combining the fact that we can fetch from any location a Git repository, we don't have to trust the location as long as we have some way to trust some party who says that this commit hash is secure and safe for certain kind of use, we can trust that that content is safe and secure for certain kind of use. And same applies for the submodules as well. So basically, we can have a completely controllable and fully audit trail repository information in the ecosystem. Then if you consider, let me try to dig another picture here. It's unfortunately in Finnish, but uh, I try to explain uh, here. If you consider, try to bear with the fact that this is in Finland, I try to translate on the fly. This is kind of a make an order. Uh, then we have an, the guy who makes the order, uh, an offer that's based for the order, and then there are some details for the uh, uh, delivery schedule uh, and all uh, additional details. Forget this language a bit. Consider that this is the name of the operation, and these are specifically typed parameters. And then we have some kind of return value. If you remember that we call this as a kind of operation.execute with certain parameters in the code, and we are expecting certain technical value to come out of it, we can replace this order or operation with this one. Simply because this one has exactly the same signature for the input. So if we have a code that says, in this case, tdlaus.execute, the same code still compiles with the same input that it was before, and for whatever uh, return value, it still matches, although the content of this operation is completely different. And <clears throat> when we calculate so-called semantic signature from this part and this part, we can have additional metadata on those repositories that can be uh, automatically matched and see that, okay, you are using uh, this kind of operation, which is calling another operation like this, and then it starts to match this kind of signatures from the library to see that, hey, here is somebody already did this part of, uh, uh, of uh, operation that you can swap in to here. So this is kind of... Uh, what we use here as a providers and requirements. Coming back to this model, if you consider that this is another operation, this would be uh, this this the sorry for the language operation would be providing this kind of signature from outside and requiring this kind of box and this kind of box to be complete software. So we can consider kind of building software for completing the box structure. And wherever we lack a box, it means that we have a code line calling and execute for an operation that's non-existent, which means that in the worst case scenario, we start writing code by hand to fulfill the constraints of the caller. <coughs> so we can basically... Con uh, same, same applies for the transformation. We can calculate the signatures for the information models so that they match. And then we can have actually additional information, again, on separate Git repository to, to uh, be certified. And we don't need any centralized certification party. I mean, for instance, your party uh, uh, of University of Bolzano can... Uh, can start to publish uh, uh, a library of modules and also certificate that you have aud audited of your modules or some, uh, for instance, Joensuu University's modules. So you cross-check your uh, 
partners modules and uh, provide another repository which can be used to uh, validate the commit signatures that I showed in the kit. Uh, then the ecosystem usage is basically building up the combination of those modules. So you simply, <coughs> let me see, I have another picture here. Mm, not this one. Hey, I had this on English, by the way. Yeah, this is the same thing. Create order was the one that I was unfortunately in Finnish. And, uh, uh, well, went through that if you bet with the Finnish. I'll show the other, other chain. Let's see, sorry. Now this is that one, that one. This is the Git model. I'll go, that, go to that soon. Uh, I've used the Visio, but I'm dropped down to the viewer, and this is getting a bit... I think I find it now. Yeah. You can consider that your uh, application... In this case, we have a digital image management application that has then, uh, this, this is what you would see in a, for instance, standard Android device, fully functional image uh, catalog of images. Then you have a grandma, grandmother version of the same digital image management. It basically has a feature which is a combination of uh, data models and operation models. So it's a pretty big package of functionality and data models that are kind of what I showed in the boxes. It's a combination of those. So it's a kind of, uh, in real world, it would be in a Git implemented, it would be something probably a few hundreds of different repositories bound together. It doesn't sound as painful when, when we go to the how the Git treats them. But basically, it means that you can have a two applications that are pretty much with the same functionality, except that for your grandma version, it doesn't provide uh, the advanced functionality at all. It, it provides just showing you the, uh, showing the grandmother the three last pictures of your kids from this week, and that's it. But the, all the core functionality would still be there. So if, uh, if this advanced application would offer you to send the images to uh, picture printing services, for instance, the same feature would be immediately available in here as well. So this is kind of uh, how you start to get to the Lego block kind of functionality from the repositories when, when they start to have the content. And then, of course, when we finally apply the uh, cross-platform generators, when we have logically defined software, it deploys on every mobile platform that the generators support. It deploys on the personal computer. It deploys partially on the cloud or as a web application. Again, with the same functionality as long as the generators are supported uh, or added later on. They can also be backported later on to, uh, so that they don't have to be there to begin with, which is usually the case when you start working with some kind of uh, current world's cross-platform library. It either supports the other platform or doesn't, and if it doesn't, you, your best bet is it, the support might come in later or it never comes. Or they might, by surprise, drop some support, for instance, Mego or QT, when the mainstream business moves out. And this is kind of uh, the Lego block modularity is made with the kind of we don't have any kind of UI for that. We have basically the technology stack, concept level technology stack up to this level or about this level. This is something that would currently require some more uh, user interface and a bit more polished uh, automation chains to become real. But they are quite straightforward to show out. And uh, they really can be built later on when the professional software development can start focusing on these uh, kind of four first boxes first. 
So this is just uh, something to be, that can be considered as later on benefit. <coughs> Okay, I'll show a few more images here. Uh, sorry, one more here. As a role, this is kind of can be also thought as a business software development. Your ecosystem doesn't have to be any more wider than organization-wide either. It starts to provide the reusability benefits even at that level. But of course, considering that uh, we are starting to raise serious interest on open source communities. This is, of course, what I would really love to see, that we start to have really pure open source libraries and ecosystems where anybody can be these business value designers or uh, end user or consumer level people. <coughs> I'll jump in a bit. Uh, this first image is basically the same described in a more value chain approach. I won't go to that. Uh, I'll briefly remind the core how why these functions cross also cross platform but kind of cross system way. Uh, given the yesterday's demonstration where we focus simply on the service level uh, contracts and abstracting from them, you can consider the operation signature equal to that one. So basically it blends that the interoperation call can traverse between networks, be interprocess call within the same code base, or with some le legacy uh, channels such as file system uh, uh, kind of batch execution. It doesn't matter how you make the information go between the systems. But basically, the automation from above platform level doesn't care either. So when I come to the ball architecture of the actual implementation of that one, it doesn't care where you run the operations nor, the, uh, nor where your data is stored because it treats everything above the platform level uh, uh, abstraction. But this is always the, the part where you can keep your feet in the ground and still remember that you can always do cross-platform service level and then your service level can be within the same code base. I mean so that you're, you have few, uh, two source code files that call each other within the same program and logically you are still doing the same thing. Uh, okay, and here I had, I had much better. I vomited you a bit series of finish. If you now recall, this is what I tried to explain. We can have uh, two operations that look from outside scope exactly the same, so they are basically interchangeable from the caller's perspective, as long as the information model is available for both. So, kind of, you can swap in a module and it still compiles so you can kind of get very customized, tailored software without writing a line of code, as long as you make some way of picking the module from the right repository. And then, uh, uh, I'll give you a very brief overview of Git distribution. Uh, how many, can we get a, some kind of, how many of you are familiar with Gits and its submodules? I am, I am rather familiar with, with Git, but not an expert basic use. Okay, there is not a lot of excitement in, in, in our room here about Git. Not enough from Kalder as well. Well, try to describe it as much more, as simple as, as simple as possible, Kalder. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a very, very brief overview. Uh, in Git, you have a full version history that's kind of uh, digitally signed uh, with the thumbprint to be uh, that very exact. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this very fast because you can, when you get the idea, you can come to revisit the picture again. Uh, basically, the ecosystem is formed up by any number of Git repositories, 
if you recall from this where I showed on our, our current implementation, we already have very small ones for each abstraction being in their own repository. So the repositories are relatively cheap in Git. They are kind of like branches, and, and they have these unique, uh, unique uh, behavioral features that, that are perfect for these kind of things. They don't have much overhead for what this ecosystem needs, but they have all the critical features to comply with it. So the idea is that we have a tiny bit of logic that can bind together any number of Git repositories. Basically, it means that we have, a, for instance, in our repositories, we have a, right now something around 20 to 30 repositories, probably. Each of them is kind of unique. They don't have to be all in GitHub. Everything, only thing you need is an address to reach the repository. It doesn't matter if it's in the GitHub and one repository is in Gitorios and one on our server. What matters is that there is some catalog that lists these locations. So you need to have some way to start up to get to the lists of other lists of other lists of other repositories. But this is completely distributed. Mm. Then you, uh, when you get that starting point from somewhere, and you have uh, cooperative parties that, well, the catalogs list other ones, then you can start building very specific uh, combinations of repositories, and you can build the combination in your local workstation. This is the level that works right this moment already if there is content in those repositories. We have a, well, it's very rough concept demonstration because we kind of move onwards to polish other things when we figured out that this is basically functionally complete already when we get, get other parts polished enough to lure in other developers to start building the ecosystem with us. So this is basically all reality in Git and XML structures already. And the core point is that if you start to understand the Git, everything you build in the final version is that you run it on your local workstation. It means that you fetch the catalogs, you fetch uh, uh, dependency signatures, the graphs, the things that help you build it from any amount of repositories, and you can run <laughs> basically up to all the resources that your workstation can take if the ecosystem starts to be large enough. But okay, this is, okay, now I'm looking at the distant future. But basically, you, you don't look for a centralized server for this. You basically can run it on your workstation. And then, of course, the Bowl implementation will be running this on behalf of the end user, which will, won't be the developer anymore. And that will be run probably on the cloud. But this is, as long as you, I link to this in the content, you basically find all this stuff in a neatly packed fashion in the blog under this all in open source and uh, abstraction ecosystem overview, if you want to revisit the stuff there. And then please come forward with me with the questions because we have the, if you, when we start to build that one, uh, we have the concept level repositories already available. We used uh, GNU PGP for digital signatures and uh, base XML, base X XML database for, uh, for the searches right now. I didn't test drive any, uh, any graph databases for now, but basically those are available as well when the content starts to scale up. Okay, uh, now would be a good, good time for questions. Uh, for the ball, we basically, I can explain that one as well, uh, but that's basically uh, based on information ownership, uh, and it kind of, it takes a concrete approach of using what you've seen before in a, in a practical fashion. It provides an application platform that's a platform neutral, works on the ADM based kind of automation and can target any of the platforms that, that its ADM modules target. So it's kind of a 
kind of a work in process, but pretty, pretty far for non-developer perspective right now. So I can explain that one, that one as well, but I think now would be a good time for uh, questions on any of the areas. Kalle, while people are thinking about questions, I would, like, I, would really, I would really like to thank you for you know, these four hours of explanation and all the huge effort you are providing. And uh, for sure, in these four hours, we all understand that uh, four hours are not enough in order to understand all, these, all, all of your huge effort in mm. developing ADM and then the and then uh, designing the, the ball and everything related to it. So first, uh, uh, first thank you very much for, for, for this workshop. C could you honestly follow it? Or you can <laughs> I would like to get some kind of feedback in a, in a however your team wants to put it. It can be constructive criticism for the parts that were blurry or something like that. But, uh, I think that at least from Bolzano, seeing that we are four people in the room today, you will get a more genuine feedback after we, I share all the videos. So people will be able to uh, see them again and, uh, and again. This is, for me, I, I began to, uh, to, to know about the EDM and the ball since, I don't know, four weeks or even before. I, I was talking about these things with you even before the start of the workshop. And I see that these are rather complex concepts, and that probably what I th what I think about the EDM is that once you you have to spend a lot of time in order to learn these these not really syntax but concepts, but once you spend this quite huge amount of time learning it, everything goes very quickly. So I think that. There is, there is a quite huge learning, learning curve on, on ADM, but results will, will come after. Yeah, that's, you're probably very right on that. Uh, if, if, uh, it depends from where you come from and what you are aiming to develop. Some aspects of it, if you've done a certain kind of .NET development with Visual Studio, something are very familiar on that area, but that's not often the case. I've recognized, and even for the Visual Studio users, uh, it's actually quite rare a business case where you really are doing cross-platform development, for instance. So it's something that uh, you are probably very right on that. It takes, it takes a while to get, get accustomed with it and see the benefits uh, and worthwhile and see if it's worthwhile to dig into or wait that others build it further. And while uh, we are waiting for, for questions, for people thinking about questions, uh, I think that for, for the future we shall organize workshop only focusing on ADM and thereafter focus directly uh, study the ball, I think. But in these four hours we, we got a very a very high level overview of everything and we are very grateful about it. Uh, so we know more and then in the future I think that we should focus more on ADM first. Yeah, uh, I kind of figured that it's more uh, valuable for you to see the whole picture and try to dive enough to see how it flows because uh, during the time, uh, I, and I, I'd be very happy to hear the feedback for the demonstration and content we have available, but basically we've tried to push in kind of that you can start from scratch playing with Visual Studio, starting with the T4 generators, and see how you build your first abstractions from scratch. Sure, there were no plans, and uh, I'm, I personally am very happy about uh, the, on the outcomes of these four hours of workshop. And uh, Mikko is happy as well, I see. And also uh, Alessandro and uh, Martina are happy. Yeah, that would be good. So that no, no time wasted, kind of. No, surely not, over. surely not. So people, you are free, you are free to talk. Well, I have one comment on the... 
ADM. I personally don't see the main advantage in the multi-platform, but I see more the advantage that it gives from a little bit an egoistic part of you that finally I, uh, I have now uh, a more formalized concept of how to make the logic parts of my code reusable. Because in the classical way, you always, again and again, you copy-paste a lot of code and then you modify it. But I think when you can really build your own templates, you can rise a little bit the level loss of the quality generally. And you can, of course, give it to beginner developers that don't need them to build everything from the scratch and make the mistakes that you just have fixed in the, in the running libraries that you have of your own code and logic. Because normally, the logic part is the part that don't go then in the generic library. So I think it helps to rise a little bit the level of the logical abstraction and not of the generic code abstraction. Yeah, I think I, I kind of agree a lot of what you said, if I, I, especially if I heard from the beginning. From, even from our perspective, we don't actually do the cross-platform ourselves much. We don't see the benefit uh, realizing from normal ICT company project scope. It's a real, really good case for, uh, for our local company, such as Rovio, who's doing multi-platform mobile game development. But until now, we are now starting to have uh, content touchable enough for explaining to them how they should be benefiting greatly from it. But again, the learning curve is such, such a steep from non-architects and non... Well, it, it is something that you really need to see the value to dive into. But if I put in my words, what I think that I heard in your comments is basically uh, kind of unifying the developer experience uh, for yourself, but also if you need to work with uh, different skill sets of developers, you can you can get a really productive results with working high with uh, pairing with high-end architects. We had uh, we did multiple inheritance in this taxation project scope, and simply using ADM and the XML schema helped us to refine the terminology we want to use in the architecture. So it worked in kind of way that we didn't have to write or agree in a whiteboard kind of fashion or try to drive it in the UML model, but we could drive immediately to an architecture where we knew that, okay, we want to use this kind of terminology, we want to constrain these kinds of things in this kind of fashion. I see that Alessandro is writing something. And some parts, <coughs> yeah, we see kind of most benefits on, uh, oh, okay, now. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Just that that's a... Uh, Is this, uh, if I read it proper, do you just call the uh, <coughs> ADM as an Esperanto XML? <laughs> or is that something you use, the, is that referring to something you currently use, or is that a way to... Uh, it's one of the code generating, it's one of the code generating tools. Okay. It's an XML, the... A part of your code, and then you let it translate. So basically, it's more. I think we can put it in the domain-specific language tools. It goes more in that direction. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> mm. uh, do we use ADM only for the model? Basically, the ADM how I <coughs> how I package it and how, why I I kind of noticed that it, it's uh, uh, what makes it kind of full package is that uh, the reason you would want to use it is that you can out start automating uh, the development parts and control your own code. So I wouldn't use it for just for the modeling. 
uh, well, for the shared benefits that uh, I'm, I have to do the software still today. But uh, I assume that if you do only modeling uh, and really live on the model-to-model -model transformation world, right now there, is, there are probably better tools for that one. But then, of course, if you need to have uh, kind of pure control of your information models and you need to refine the information flows in a pure fashion, which starts to bring in the pure reusability, uh, then you start to be in the area where you probably benefit from kind of uh, opportunist modeling that ADM provides. Because you don't have to constrain your model uh, to be done outside of your software project and then reuse it as an external library, but you can on the, on the fly modify it when you need to in the project. And that's one of the low risk compromises that you don't then have because you can start using a model and a project and very radically move, uh, make the changes during the project in it. So your project never has to stop and wait somebody else to make modifications on the model uh, and or gener generators. And even, even uh, if you drive heavily outside and away from existing model, it's still very straightforward to communicate back to the makers of the original model uh, and the generators that, hey, I made these changes, uh, so you change the model like this, and I changed the generators like this, so it kind of... Uh, streamlines the communication in between. But of course, it's only beneficial if both ends share the, well, yeah, share the ADM modules, but that's of course the case if you grab it from the library anyway. <laughs> and just... Yeah, yeah, continue, please. Yeah, just, uh, just thinking... Uh, but there were times um, we haven't altered ADM much during the last two years. Uh, one, one particular part was when I introduced the modular features of it and took some kind of design approach, how to approach that one. That was a time when I was considering some uh, uni more uh, commonly used makefile tooling. Uh, at some stage, I did consider some other... Uh, template generators for the generating part. The XML I have never uh, never really saw a reason to replace. But what I'm trying to say that um, uh, the current tooling for the ADM is simply there because I've seen it as the most practical and best working compromise of all things. It does kind of require you to run the mono development, uh, sorry, mono develop and mono runtime on cross platform. Java could be alternative. At, at some stage it could be replaced with the native ports as well. But then we given our resources and the fluent experience in Visual Studio, we kind of stick with that one. Uh -huh. But I'm trying to say that, uh, uh, it doesn't actually matter if you use some parts of it and you, if you have strong tooling right now to handle the XML and the code generation, it doesn't really matter. If you uh, rip off few features that you push your artifacts to be source controllable and kind of, for instance, take the advantage of the Git as we do with the ADM, I would say that you get all the benefits and I would even go as far as you could call it an, as an ADM with a different tooling. So it's not that you have to comply with all the practical tools that we are using to take advantage of the, of the model and the structure of the uh, kind of higher level abstraction. Are there questions from Nico? No, this is, <laughs> there is a lot of things what we must go through to understand this <laughs> whole system. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, have you experience of uh, uh, to software processes generally? Does it? Yeah, actually, um, <coughs> Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, this is a good topic. Uh, let me try to rephrase it, what I was saying. Oh, not rephrase, because I didn't just say anything. Um, we kind of experienced really effective software process uh, using ADM, and we've mapped it in uh, various of processes. But basically, it, it seems to fit on any also non-software process for a certain approach. So in a short, it probably applies. Can, do you want to refine the question in a more specific way? No, I think that uh, how, how, how we can um, use uh, in, in Agile team is, for example, Scrum or something like that. Yeah, let me try to grab in a picture for how we modeled. Uh, this is a comparison of, uh, well, this is uh, not trying to downplay Agile, because this is not uh, an uh, either or alternative. This is unfortunately in Finnish. But basically, usually you have these kinds of components in your software process. I'll uh, transfer. I'll briefly see if I have this in English. If you have uh, just a few minutes, I can try to answer this question. Uh, let's see. Oh, then I just walk, walk you through with the Finnish one. We have some kind of requirement first to or need for something. If we don't have that one, we probably don't have the money coming in either, so it's a kind of requirement. Then we have a specific specification made by the customer, a client. We kind of nail down something to start the project. As it doesn't matter how agile we play, we have some kind of fix, some kind of agreement of what we are to deliver. Once we've figured that one out, and if there is some kind of real life budget, we probably have a change requirement uh, management as well, uh, because we alter the design as we need to on the fly. Then we have some kind of, uh, and okay, this is a bit heavier process, but we have some kind of uh, planning beforehand. We choose a platform, for instance, or some libraries or some, <laughs> something like that, make some kind of uh, choice of design, might draw something on UML or not. We might have some documentation out of it. Then becomes implicit design. This is basically what's traditionally written in code. So... When you use object-oriented languages, when you try to reduce your own work, you kind of make on-the-fly decisions where you use inheritance, where you use library structures, and all that kind of stuff. It kind of starts to hard-code your uh, decisions. It, it becomes, uh, the more you use that kind of reusability, the more you risk on harder, diffi more difficult refactoring. But, of course, you need to compromise because you cannot write everything uh, in a dull language. I mean, anyway, using modern object-oriented language kind of starts to constrain your approach. Uh, then there is a final implementation on top of that, a testing uh, the usability. And if we look this from the public sector area or larger project, basically at some stage you have start to have a chosen provider for this because the personalization, the ways that company and that team works, it becomes too cumbersome and difficult to, uh, to uh, change the theme for light basis. Of course, if they overprice themselves or are not available, then the customer will have a problem that they, they are going to solve with uh, changing the provider. And then that's what, what we get to the maintenance phase. Then we have the project manager here that's trying to... Uh, communicate what's happening here uh, in a kind of way that if they need additional budget or they start to negotiate on additional features, not even going out of the budget, but for further development. And then the steering group is uh, claiming or giving the money to the thing. Now, what we can do with, uh, mm, with the ADM and what we actually did in the taxation agency is something like this. Uh, sorry, no, it wasn't that, but basically, 
not it wasn't this fluent in the taxation agency, but it could have been. We kind of concept demonstrated then that this could be done. Uh, the customer is treating these uh, logical operation specifications as a use cases or, or uh, alike level. So they are the specification makers are uh, competent enough to deal with that one. The steering group is actually following automatic real-time status reporting. As I briefly demonstrated, when I toggle in an already implemented feature as under design, it means that there needs to be work done for that. And when we have atomic uh, features of small scale enough, we can see that, for instance, 40 of those items equal to X amount of hours equal to X amount of money. And, and it's, it's real-time monitoring. So if some de software designer understands that we need to alter the design and suddenly you have uh, 120 operations popping up as uh, under design, these people can make the decision that, okay, for the lifetime uh, basis, it's feasible to do, but they understand that it costs right now or it delays the project for the two weeks and we are not going live now, but we go live with a better version. Uh, the ADM supported uh, uh, design and development is happening on design controlled implementation. Basically, what you see in the intelligence uh, aware XML is that uh, you can tag in a new developer and he's productive really fast when he simply learns how to fill in the XML uh, and how to run the generators and code the coding hooks. And when they learn that one, they pretty fast actually learn if they are capable uh, to modify the model as well, modify and maintain the generators. We kind of, in, in real world, experience that uh, people who are titled as software developers and are, are by no means architects, uh, they still learn how they can maintain the generators. So it, it becomes very flexible. Architects can kind of overlook that it's doing, they are doing proper things, but he can outsource all kinds of tasks, these normal developers, which is a huge, huge productivity boost for the uh, really limited architect resources. And then the testing becomes much smaller because the automation doesn't tend to uh, mess up with the code. When you have a mature automation and code generation, it doesn't break uh, on the fly. Uh, and if it does break, it usually breaks the whole software entirely. So if you are uh, generating one layer uh, of your software completely, for instance, database layer, and you mess up with transaction management, it means that you messed up the transaction management for the whole system, and you will notify that pretty much uh, faster than if you are uh, <coughs> just breaking it uh, at the one, one step at a time. And this is kind of an on-the-fly model that you push, push uh, releases on production and the way you started the project, you kind of maintain it by simply adding another operation or opening, <laughs> opening the operations under design mode, adding features and that kind of behavior. So this is how we see kind of... Uh, and this is for one project scope, but then, of course, the steering group starts to see all their projects in the same kind of fashion because their reporting is equal, regardless of what platform or what tooling they are using. And because it seems to be the same thing for the developer, they can actually start competing and have cross um, multiple providers, multiple companies providing the services or as we see in the longer scope in Finland and in global scale, smaller companies can start participating on what's traditionally considered uh, high-end advanced architectures that has been a kind of property of larger and more expensive and clumsy enterprises. So, yeah, so I think this is perhaps <coughs> very efficient way uh, to measure or <laughs> do something like that. And then, yeah, the, what I was thinking, uh, how we started to demonstrate something, it, it really starts to bring in the power when you need some specific technical specialty to do something. 
if you order it from an ADM automation module, you can let go of the specialty and have your normal developers just take advantage of it and or make a normal subscription kind of deal with that provider that they maintain that very specific part and they focus only on that. They don't have to take any responsibility outside, which again kind of uh, promotes those very specific technical uh, skills because they can start focusing on that area and simply outsource the actual production version to larger teams. I see there was a... Yes, we are running out of time, but then there is, I would say that we can answer Alessandro, Alessandro, Alessandro's question and then we will uh, uh, close this, the, today's session. And from what I understand, uh, the, the prop, uh, when you define something through XML, then you um, generate a C sharp files and then you refine changes on the C, on the C sharp files. However, then uh, another, yeah. yeah, so this is. I, I got it, I got the question. Uh, you don't change the same files. You kind of. If you play it in kind of way that you treat the automation as a separate developer, uh, the easiest solution is that you call a code in a fashion that you, your implementation is in a different class, for instance. So you don't compete with the automation on the uh, same actual physical source code file. In C Sharp, you can use partial classes for that. In Java, you basically use a different implementation uh, class for the actual functional method body. That's how I would use it. Then you can of course have, you can try to do it in kind of merging the content, but uh, I haven't yet came up with an I uh, scenario where I would see that feasible, unless you have really tight constraints on the output that you produce for legacy reasons or uh, for for various reasons. Then you might might put the actual coding body. Well, uh, okay. Uh, we did in the unit test automation in a fashion that we manually edited the code within the generator code, but then copy pasted it as is to the XML C data block, which then copy pasted, I mean generators take took it in a vanilla fashion to the code. That is, so you wouldn't manually compete with the generators, but just uh, provide it as an input for them. Well, let's say that you really, really teased our attention, uh, as you probably are noticing because of all these questions, and uh, Again, thank you for these four hours, for these uh, four intense hours of uh, your effort. And uh, sure, you will uh, hear from me soon because I will share the videos through to all the participants, also for, to who could not be with us today. And uh, I will find a way to collect some feedbacks for, to, uh, from people uh, and provide them to you as well because we are really interested as a as researchers, we are really interested in uh, this whole thing and we would like to see how we can continue with this collaboration and involve other people as well. Okay.